Hey, let's start the show. It's September 5th, 2013. Welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. I'm Will Smith. Joining me today, once again, directly on the left, a kind of frustrated looking Norman Chan. Yes, I'll explain my frustration. I'm going to put, I have the audio, so I'll put the audio at the end so people can hear how the first so, version you know of this what? conversation went. The, we're not going to do the conversation again. I think we, I think probably let's not do let's, the conversation and, and for again. for multiple reasons, one that there's... Practicing that conversation is not a good not thing. A good, no. Especially for that topic. Yes. Uh, I'm going to preface this by saying I'm disgruntled because we just recorded... About a 15-minute conversation. Oh, more than that. No, I'm looking at the 15, clock. 15, it was. It just felt like longer. It couldn't have been more than 14 minutes. It felt minutes. like a long, a long time. Of, and it's the second time it's happened. Uh, the first time is when the baby name was dropped. Uh, yes, but this was a technical okay. difficulty. Anyway, not my mistake. Welcome to the podcast. Hi. And Norman Ch- Jeremy Williams is joining us on our left. Hi. Hi, He's Jeremy. He's wearing a cool t-shirt. <laughs> hey, Jeremy. Yeah. You're my favorite guest. <laughs> Thanks for having me it's back. Much creepier the I second am, time. I am both tired and ignorant. What could go wrong? Um, Gary Witta. <laughs> Don't beat me. <laughs> no, no, let's not, let's not go through the beats. It's, um, it's bad. So, uh, so yeah, if you want to hear the lost conversation, uh, just just listen past the end music and we'll Okay, you'll so hear that. to set up the context, uh, we were out last week. There was a dad cast last week. Yep. We didn't cover any of the tech news. So we're going to cover all of that today. Or at least the high points. Uh, at least the high points, the big stuff we missed. Uh, if people don't know, Jeremy Williams, uh, an old coworker, great friend. Um, He's been on enough that we he, don't have to introduce well, him at this point, I think. For s- some new people um, and uh, you, a lover of Apple products. So that's yeah. very interesting. Which you need represented on this panel, apparently. So hey, I'm, I'm, I have a Mac. You seem you seem like you go both ways. I, I like to keep an open mind. Right on. No, um, not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> no, right. <laughs> <laughs> I put my keys in the bowl just like everybody else. Um, um, okay. So, so uh, we're going to start off. Uh, Let's talk, talk about start Dragon off. Con. Right. We, we're gonna, you, you've lost your PAX opportunity. Can I can I share a couple of high moments? From okay, PAX? you can share high moments if okay. you want for the full talk about packs and and rape culture and, and no, dick no, no, wolves no, 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 no. and all that stuff. It's at the end of the show. Yes, because we I feel like we need to address that. I don't know how I kind of feel about packs as okay. a result of the but behavior of Mike and Jerry. The um, high points, or Mike specifically, I guess. The how, high points. How many packs have you been to for context? Three or four. Okay. Like almost I, since I started going, I've been to all the ones on, in Seattle. I haven't been to the East ones yet. Okay, and it's gotten bigger every year. It's huge. All right. This year, this year, like they did four days instead of three, which is new. It, each day was full. And you were saying one hundred thousand people. I Norm said that. I thought it was fifty thousand people, but it is a shitload of people either way. Wow. Um, and, and they sell a lot of one-day badges, so I'm sure each of those one-day badges, even though a lot of them are used by one person for four days, each count as a person, just like Comic-Con. Um, My big takeaway is that I think it's reached critical mass, and uh, the controversy isn't worth um, it making it's taking a stance on going to PAX or not going to PAX. If you want to enjoy the camaraderie, set up your own thing outside of PAX, which is what people do for Comic-Con. Indie publishers yeah. book hotels outside, and they are not affiliated with Comic-Con I don't at even all. know that the Penny Arcade guys own PAX anymore. Oh, they, they do. Really? Yeah. Um, the, the upshot is, I think that the good that you get from PAX is, is very good. I don't know that it outweighs the bad that is, is coming to light. So high points. Yeah, high points. Um, I played Transistor, which is the new game from uh, the guys who made Bastion. Uh, that super game, giant game. Super giant. That game is fucking amazing. With the, like, the 15 minute demo or whatever that they're running, 10, it seemed like it was maybe 10 or 15 minutes. I didn't actually time it. Is really, really gorgeous. It's a turn based. Um, well, it's kind of a beat em up. It's kind of turn based. You can, if you were good at beat em ups, you could probably play it as a beat em up. If you're, if you're not, then you'll play it as a turn based thing. What, what platform? Uh, I think PS4 and PC is at launch. I'm sure it'll be on 360 at some point or, or Xbox One at some point, maybe 360 and PS3. Um, it has the same kind of art style as Bastion. The music is again by Darren Korb. It's gorgeous and there's break beats and it's it's really nice and, and makes me happy and smile. Um, the they do the narration thing again with this game. It is a uh, doesn't seem like it's the same same narrator, who I think is on staff at 
at uh, at Supergiant. Um, but it's a, it's just a really gorgeous game. It's something unlike. It's it takes it pulls things from a bunch of different games that I've never played. The thing I told Greg Casavan after I played the demo was that basically I, I'm in for whatever they do at this point. Yeah. Like if they want to make a Japanese dating sim slash fishing simulator, you're there. I'm there. Greg Casavan. Casavan. Yeah. Um, I think that that's a really good. Uh, an, what they've done, what they've done, and what they did with Giant Bomb. So the Super Giant Games guy used to. There are a development team. Greg used to work at GameSpot, and they were friends with the Giant Bomb guys. And when they were developing Bastion, they did this series with Giant Bomb where they uh, basically sh- uh, took like thirty minutes to, once a week to follow along with the development yeah. and really put themselves out there. Um, and which a lot of developers, I mean, it's it's different than it's hard to do. I would think. Uh, because it wasn't like a pure marketing thing too. I mean, for good or bad, it was like their journey. And uh, they built a lot of goodwill and you got to know them a lot. And that transparency really builds this affinity for them that I think people are like developers and uh, on the editorial side, I think it's a really smart thing to do. Kind of not unlike what uh, Double Fine has done, right? With uh, ab- absolutely. Kind of. Except polished. they're a small, small, it's like, I'll, I'll put it in your terms, what Marco Arment did with Instapaper. Just being, being both a great developer but also a personality with things to say and with you know interaction with the community. Here's the other thing that that um, so I, ta- I got to talk to Darren a little bit before a panel one day, and and we were talking about like they had massive success with Bastion, obviously, and that gave them at that point they had choices, and it seemed like they wanted like rather than go big and start multiple teams and do like five games and become a big big game developer they they hired enough people to fill out like a core roster of skills so they don't have to hire contractors anymore but then they're they're kind of feeling like they're they just want to keep small and just work on one thing at a time and make good games which i really appreciate i think that's really cool um i saw the vlambeer stuff uh luftrausers and i can't remember what the name of the roguelike is um luftrausers looks great it's like an ipad kind of momentum shooter thing so you you have thrust almost like a rocket like a rocket, like a, um, not like asteroids, because that's not, what was the, what was the arcade game with like gravity wells? A space war? Space war. Um, so it's kind of like that, except for you're, you're in the sky above an ocean and you're fighting like battleships and planes that are coming at you from a horizontal perspective on 2D. It was really fun. I think there's, I think they did an initial flash prototype of that a long time ago, or it's based off a of flash game and you can go try that. Um, I, got to play um, I'm trying to think what else I saw I saw Titanfall I didn't get to actually play that um, what's Titanfall it's the respawn game from the Call of Duty guys so remember the big Call of Duty controversy yeah. where they left Act- Jason West and the team left Activision and this they set up a deal with EA for Titanfall uh, I, is it exclusive on console for it's, Xbox it's PC and Xbox one right probably coming like it's they, right. they doesn't seem like they have exclusivity forever but uh, there's no current plans for a PS4 version. So the people I've talked to who played at PAX and at E3 said that it's it's like this great deathmatch game with mechs. I sat and watched it for maybe 40 minutes, watched people play for like 40 minutes, which by the time I had done that, I could have just waited in the fucking line, but I was having a good time watching people play and talking to them as they came out. It's real. It's very, very... Remember when you saw Battlefield 2142? Yep. It's what I wanted that game to be, so is what it seems like. So deathmatch with mechs, but lots of like... Uh, it's vertical a, movement, so you're climbing, like, yeah. running along walls. Jump jets, you mean? No, no, no. The the humans can mantle and wall run and climb up on walls. Oh, you're not in a mech, but you can. You be can in a mech. be. Oh, so wow. it's both mechs and and humans. So the the mech you get kind of like um like the the it's it. They were really careful not to say this, but it seems like it's kind of like the the perks, like the things that you get dropped on you in Call of Duty games now. So you, like, if you kill like, people well, yeah. then you get time. But it seems like it's also time based. So it seems like everybody eventually gets a shot at having a mech. Um, there's loadouts for both the human, your human character and your mech. They have all sorts of different weapons. The one that looked like the most fun on the mech was a force field that grabs incoming projectiles and then fires them back at whoever shot them at you. Um, there's a, the maps are super vertical, even beyond the walls. So like, like all the buildings around you can get up on the roofs of, uh, and jump from one roof to the other. And then like, that was the best way to get on the mechs. Cause if you're on the ground, the mechs 10 feet above you, 15 feet above you, they're shooting down over walls and everything. You have no cover. If you're on the rooftop, you can actually do a little more damage. It seemed like there was some kind of bullet penetration stuff happening, but I couldn't really tell. Um, and it's just really fast and looks... It, it's the first thing I've seen that looks like not a good PC game from the next generation. 
not a not it it looks like it's better than a good pc good looking pc game from the current generation it actually looks like a next generation game so it's it's really interesting because those guys they did call of duty which was great on pc and then became this huge phenomenon on console and everyone was wondering what they would do after they left call of duty but they took all those lessons they've learned in these high speed deathmatch style you know the new wave of new style of multiplayer combat and did this twist on it it's it it looks really neat um it I would say the I didn't like I said no hands on but from what watching it looked more deliberate than Call of Duty like it looked like it's a little bit slower looked a little bit slower than your traditional Call of Duty which was you know a mouse and keyboard game first um, but not as slow as like a Halo or something like that right is there a single player component no no single player component so I I as I understand it it's kind of like Brink in the positive way in that the single player component is all fulfilled like the the per story progression is all fulfilled by going on multiplayer on missions with other people and things happen that are special to you or something it's that that stuff's all a little bit unclear sounds cool um other highlights i'm going back to twitter to find out what i said yesterday were highlights i play i learned to play seven wonders finally i never played that before it's a board game it's a board game i think it won uh the german best board game prize like three years ago the spiel de yar yeah um it's it's uh it's great for that kind of a setting because you don't like pax time at pax is valuable in that there's a lot to do and you kind of don't want to spend like six hours playing Arkham Horror or something. Um, so uh, Seven Wonders is neat because all everybody does their turn simultaneously. Uh, and, and as a result, once people understood how to play, it went really fast. We also played a lot of Resistance. Um, I basically just carried a copy of the Resistance around. If somebody said, hey, you want to play the Resistance? I was like, yeah, sure, I have it right here. Let's go. Do you play board games, or tabletop games? I haven't played any of the new ones. I know that's a huge movement right now, yeah. that there's a renaissance. that You can you can even make your own. There's yeah. companies that will help you do that, which is awesome. And I what impresses me most about them is that it seems like games can last, I mean, obviously you can adjust the rules, but 45 minutes, you know, or an hour. When, when the box says 30 minutes, it can actually be 30 minutes. Yeah, because I'm used to Monopoly, you know, which it was hours. And that's not fun for hours. Right. Or Game of Thrones, which is not fun for... Well, it's fun. Sometimes fun for four hours. Sorry about that. You linked to a uh, to an image of a space based uh, board game, Eternal. Oh, um, uh, Eminent Domain. Eminent Domain. That game's great. And it, I just the graphics alone had me hooked. I want to play that. Well, you should come down to the house and we'll play that game. I would like to. Um, it is. I didn't play any Eminent Domain. They didn't have a copy in the loaner thing. I didn't bring my copy with me. Um, but uh, yeah, it was it was really good. It's it's a really good game. It's kind of like a light four X strategy game rules in a in a board game um and there's a there's another game called eclipse that is a super like realistic portrayal of 4x like masters of orion and those types of games um but it's like a five-hour game it might be a little intense for somebody starting out eminent domain is a good place to start um let's see what else did i play i played lovers in a dangerous space time which was one of the pax 10 games it is uh two you, you are in a spaceship that is spherical. There are a bunch of stations inside. If you've ever played, what is it, Space Team? Space Team. If you've played Space Team, it's kind of like that, but only with two players. And the things that you might be doing inside the spaceship, like you have to fight off pirates or, or bad guys. It's called Lovers in a Dangerous Space Time. Yes. That is a great like 80s it, uh, pulp novel. It seems like a Harlan Ellison book. Like with, with a great cover, I have of, no like, eyes. Two people and I must like, scream. like reaching out for each other in, in like some like zero gravity. Yes. So, so two people are on That's the spaceship. That's my next indie band. You sit down. It's local, local, co- local co-op only. Um, there's six stations, I think. Like turrets on four, four axes of the thing. There's a shield that covers maybe a sixth or an eighth of the of the circle that is the outside of your ship. Uh, you can steer that in place in different places. There's a thruster. There's a huge mega cannon that just basically like fires a one eighth arc around your ship and takes out anything that it touches. I didn't realize we've moved on from board games. I thought this was very impressive. I'm going back and forth. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm, there's no particular order. Um, so, yeah, it's not, this is a video game. Got it. Uh, and two, it's two-player local co-op. So you sit down on a couch with somebody and you play this, and it gets really, like Space Team, it gets really frantic very quickly. Um, you have to communicate well. I sat down and played it with a random dude that was in line with me, and we had a really good time. We Wait, played space, like two games. Space Team is iOS one. Space Team is iOS, and it's the thing where you have like different buttons. Like one person gets yeah, a, a okay. command. You're not talking about Star Command. I'm not talking about Star okay, Command. Space Team is like press the squiggly button. Right, right. Where people yell at each you, other. You yell yeah. at each other. Yeah. Um, it's I one of the great bar games. Co-op is is a market that is just needs to be tapped better. I love co-op games. Good. Co- have you played Payback? 
Uh, no. We should play Payback. Um, High points? Uh, Samurai Gun. Samurai Gun is a like brawler. It's real pixel arty. Uh, it's basically one hit kills, dive kick style. And you play a samurai that has a gun with three bullets. It's four players all on the same screen. It is super duper fast. Really, really manic. I'm and not and sold. really cool. But- a game where you're a samurai with only three bullets. With a gun with three bullets. With a gun with three bullets. Yeah. That, that, that itself tells you everything you yeah. need to know. Like I, I saw the pixel art on the banner. I was like, oh, okay, I'm going I'm to like this. Why, and then Max Tempkin was sitting there because he's publishing it. Why does apparently. he have three, three bullets? Huh. Um, Any Oculus games? I, I interviewed the guys who make that Omni treadmill. They were playing Half-Life 2, I think, on it. But I, the video is, I fucked up the video, something fierce on it. So we're probably going to can the interview and just talk to them when they come to San Francisco next time. Yeah. Um, I got to see that thing in action. It's kind of weird. Yeah. It's got Teflon. It's like you wear golf shoes with Teflon pads instead of foot cleats. Yeah, I've seen. And they use. Um, it's not wheels. It's just. It's it's like a disc. It's like, it's like you know, those snowboard, those sledding discs. Yeah. The, it's like that. It's that kind of thing. And then you have wait, this wait, weird. Does the wheel actually turn on the bottom of the shoe? No, there's no wheels. It's yeah, just slides. No wheels. Yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's not and like a. It's not like a yeah, one no. of those uh, wheelies or whatever those. This, is, this is the way to yeah. solve this problem cheaply. That's the only way yeah. to do it. Yeah. yeah. So right now they're using. Um, they're not connects. They're the Hydra technology, um, Sixth Sense, uh, to to detect movement. You. The weird thing about it is you also put on like a climbing belt that has hooks that go over the lip of that middle, that, that rim that goes around your waist. And the dude was really leaning into it. And like watching a man sprint when he couldn't see where he was putting his feet because he's wearing a pair of Oculus goggles, terrifying. Like he, uh, so the, the, the folks I talked to said it's like a 15 minute kind of ramp up process usually until you kind of get your sea legs with it. Uh, you'll probably wipe out and have the belt catch, catch you a couple of times while you're getting up to that is what was strongly implied. You, um, which is why they're like doing a, demos on the floor. A harness, like a you wear a harness. I mean, like for, to catch yourself if you fall. Yeah. So the harness, the harness has like a metal. Uh, if you're, you're if you're listening to the audio, it's like an L clamp that dangles out over the edge of the rim of the of the upper disc that holds you in place. So it kind of catches you. Is what it seems like. A bungee, so you can like sprint and then jump. I think then, bungee, I do not think you would want to jump. That would give you too much give. You would nail your chin yeah. on the rim. It's it's this seemed like you could potentially lose teeth if it went badly. Yeah. <laughs> next next version. Um, let's see. I also got to watch people play Super Time Force, which is the Cappy Games game. It is a. It's just really weird. It's like a platforming roguelike with time travel elements. When you die, you can roll back in time and then bring another person into that game, and that person is playing with the the version of you that played the first time. Whoa. And then you die, that person dies, and you go back in time and bring another person in until there's like three or four people fighting in the same place at the same time, but they're all you. And it was like, you just kind of go cross-eyed after a minute or two. It looks... Quite a concept. It looked really neat. Um, that's kind of the hype. I, like, there was a ton of other stuff. Like, the, the, the best part about PAX is that Indie Mega booth where they just have literally dozens and dozens and dozens of games. Um, Rims Capsule, which I heard about on Idle Thumbs, I think, first. It's an iOS game, maybe on Steam now, or maybe just Greenlight, where you basically can, you're building a base, and it's it's like a people placement board game, but in a video game. It's really cool. I talked to that guy for a little bit. Um, I saw the next uh, Pixel Junk game, Pixel Junk Inc., which is also looks really pretty. I, don't, I have no idea what it is, but the art's great, because they always are. Um, and then uh, I played Jeopardy with Dan Amrick and Chris Kohler and cool. Brett Elston from Future, which was fun. Is that going to be a video? Uh, I, it's probably on Twitch. They streamed it live that night. It, they do a game show night there now. Um, and then on Sunday, they did the Max and the Cards Against Humanity guys did a panel that was gave half of their panel or maybe a little bit more than that to a Ryan Davis tribute, which was really nice. Um, and just a bunch of us got up and shared videos and stupid shit that Ryan had done over the years. And I laughed and cried, and it was really good. So... Uh, and then, then we got to pitch Cards Against Humanity cards to the cards guys. And, and as always, they tore apart the people in the crowd who pitched the cards. No, there were t- two good ones. There were there were actually quite a few good ones. Next indie band, if they could make a Battleship movie, and then what can make next. Like, yeah. Those, those are good ones. Yeah. I watched it on the airplane. How did that go? Uh, I was not allowed to, and I did it anyway. Did, did it pop up a warning or something? No. When you sign in for the you know, go-go flight, they're like, don't do it. We block don't. HBO and Netflix, but they don't block Twitch. So I could stream it and set the like lowest quality. Super low quality. And it totally worked. 
maybe a little bit of hiccuping. Yeah, it was it was a really it was, it was a nice way to cap off packs. Magical. I mean, in the magical flying, of the content or magical that you were in a, kiss, the, a seat a magi- in the sky. Magical that I was in a seat in the sky watching a streaming video live live event happening because I follow, because I saw people tweet the link on Twitter. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. It do was. You, that do, was you, do you buy the uh, mo- the daily pass or do you have a monthly thing? No, I bought the uh, the trick is and you know they sell different um, different. It's different pricing whether you're on a phone or a tablet. Yes, I did not know or, that. or laptop. Or laptop. It's more expensive on a laptop, so I bought it with my phone and yes. then tethered to my laptop. That makes no sense. Wow, really? Yeah, I'm not, and and you do the buy two hours, get one extra hour, and for a four hour flight, I slept for the first hour and then was up for the next three hours. There you go. You have gamed the system. I, we're traveling oh, enough. This it was month. expensive. I paid the thirty dollars for unlimited use for it's, the next month, but then I have to remember to cancel. Yeah, 30, for, the, for the whole month. It's thirty dollars on my flight. It's like twenty bucks. Were a you on day. Virgin or were you on Delta? Delta. Different, different, so different rates for different airlines. So stupid. Yeah, they really need. They've really fucked up pricing for that in a bad way. You remember when Google was giving <sighs> it away? It, but that was both wonderful and terrible. Why? Because it was terrible because everybody was using it, and so the speed was really bad. It was free, though. It was fantastic. And plus, they'd even lend you a laptop. That's true. Yeah, well, a Chromebook. Chromebook. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's PAX. I got 300 street passes, and I, I, would, I met probably a couple hundred readers. I didn't count. I should have counted. Um, you should have walked with a clicker. I should have walked with a clicker. That would have been really dumb. Uh, but, yeah, it was really it's, I mean, gave everyone a number. Your number one twenty three. We took a lot of pictures. It was fun, it, and we took the baby. So basically, her immune system she's she's basically unbreakable at this point. If she's if she hasn't gotten sick by let's say Friday. Um, how's Dragon Con, Norm? Can I talk about Dragon Con now? Yeah, now's time. <laughs> uh, I also went oh on my trip god, last it's not week. streaming again. Shut no, up. No, I'm just fucking with you. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> I dropped the headphone and walked away. I, I would have. I, um, now, for the uninitiated yeah. people like me, what is Dragon Con? So I'm going to tell the whole story, and we're, it'll be another half hour before we get to tech. How established is Dragon Con? It's been going on for about 25 years. So, really? Yeah. So, okay. Also controversy related to Dragon Con. Yeah, also there's, there's sexu- a... F'd up controversy. Um, Joey and I left uh, last Sunday. It was both our birthday weekends, basically. And we flew out to Dragon Con. We stayed with uh, Wes, my housemate. He's from Atlanta. And we actually had, uh, when we were back at Whiskey, we had a couple other writers from Atlanta. They were tested south, um, Sam Cook and, and Bobby. Um, Fenlon. No. No, Fenlon is Wes's last name. So um, I just got to stay in an actual south, southern lake house for two days. And I've, n- I've never done that before in my life, and where I get to wake up in the morning and go for an hour-long swim at 8 a.m., and then come back and barbecue. And if I only, was really jealous of if this. If only there was Wi-Fi. There was at AT and T and Verizon. Like uh, Wes and uh, Joey had Wi-Fi, but AT and T. There were spots in the house where I get edge, and I would walk around, just like leave my phone on, and hopefully buffer some email. You know, there was tweets. a New York Times article for people like you, Norm. No, that was that was a column. The Nick Bilton column was about people burying their phones in public places. It wasn't about uh, needing to be connected all the time. They're two different things. I just want to check email. Okay. I need to be interacting on Twitter or anything. I okay. Just, I just wanted to check email. You're not defensive, though. No, not at no, all. No, 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 not okay. at all. Okay. But again, Lake House cannot recommend it. Also, Can uh, I, you can't recommend could it? Could not recommend it enough. Okay. That was an important word you omitted there. And um, did you did you see any snakes or anything? No snakes. Also, it uh, brought out how, how much of a city person I am. Like, spiders? Oh, my God. That's what did it for you? There's so many spiders. It wasn't driving through Houston and you looking around saying, I don't know how people can live someplace like this. It's the fifth biggest city in the country. Uh, I mean, oh, driving like outside the perimeter, I guess, of Atlanta to, to Hartwell, where, where the lake was, was interesting because it was very green. Like, it was like Walking Dead setting around there. And it's like, wow, I could totally see. Like, this is the Walking Dead freeway. What's beyond those trees? I don't know. Zombies. It's freeway and just tons of trees. And oh, there's a Waffle House. There's a McDonald's. Did you go there's to Waffle House while yep. you were there? Did you go to Bojangles? Went to Bojangles. What'd you have? A chicken sandwich. It was a mistake. But you didn't get, you got to get the biscuit. I, I, regardless, Bojangles was not fantastic. Uh, we were oh. like hoping, oh, we'll find some like mom and pop coffee shop or some some oh, breakfast no, place. No thing as a like in, in the south and in you know. Be, <laughs> what? Some place you can get some gingerbread pancakes with lemon curd? Nope. Not so much. No. 
So this was more important to you than Dragon Con? No, I'm, I'm building up. Oh, I'm sorry. Chronologically. He's telling the story, man. Sorry, telling man. the story. But he got to the end first, so I thought he skipped over the... Oh, no, that's right. where but, I started there. Yeah. Oh. We started two days. Gotcha. I wanted to decompress gotcha. before the onslaught of Dragon Con. And then uh, stopped by Athens, which is where uh, Wes went to school. Did you go skiing or anything while you were at the lake? Did you have a boat? We did not have a oh, we skiing. We didn't have a speedboat. Okay. We had a party boat. Like a float boat. Which is great. One of those like electric motor and gas motors and took the electric motor out to the middle of the lake and just drank beer Take and, your and played played tabletop games. Like that's real. That's a real nerdy. I've hey, never even thought about that at the lake, but that seems like a good time on a party boat. Yeah. In the lake, hang out in the sun and playing playing a card game. Yeah. Excellent. A lot of fun. Um, Dragon Con. Uh, been going on for 25 years. The controversy is that one of the co-founders of Dragon Con is in litigation right now for... He's uh, a pederast, he's, dude. He's a pedophile. He is, he, is, he is not convicted, but... He's settling. Yes. It's a civil suit, right? Uh, I, I think they're criminal suits. And okay. he was on probation and, and then got caught on probation. Ugh. And it is fucked up. Um, and which has turned a lot of people away from Dragon Con. And legitimately so, because this guy is crazy. But this year, the organizers... Uh, they split off from him. They Did they paid, buy him they, out they or something? They bought him out and okay. bought, it created a new organization for Dragon Con. So the money that goes to Dragon Con, the, the ticket price, no longer pays for his like legal fees, which is like that is that's wrong. fucked up. That yeah. Is, yeah, that is that is talk about things to stand. There's against. no there's no middle ground there. No, that's no, like no, we no. can all agree. No, there's there's no long blog post by the pedophile about I've thought about this for a couple of days and here's here's how I really feel. No, that's not going to happen. Um, so it's. I've been to Comic Con, been to E3, been to PAX, been to a variety of you know fan type conventions. Dragon Con is unlike any of them because there was no theme. There was no original theme. You would think with the name Dragon Con, it is mostly fantasy themed, right? Not so. It's just fan themed. If you're a fan of anything, there is something for you at Dragon Con. Uh, people at Dragon Con who love it and who have been going for years love to say how anti Comic Con it is. And they go to Comic Con also, a lot of them. But Comic Con is very corporate. It's you know big boots, giant exhibit hall, massive. But people are throwing you T-shirts, wanting you to sign, watch commercials, sign up for newsletters. Like Robert Downey like Jr. is all, there. All sort of, it's a big promotional campaign for companies of all shapes and sizes. Dragon Con has almost none of that. There's zero corporate presence. Even the indie stuff. The biggest company I think I saw there was like you know book publishers maybe for fantasy novels or. Um, uh, Geek Chic, the company that makes those tabletop tables and the wooden swords and stuff like that. Like that was probably the biggest company. It was. Um, other thing is, it, there's no convention. So we're talking about how PAX is in uh, the Seattle Convention Center, a massive, and you know Comic Con's in San Diego Convention Center, WonderCon in Anaheim, and you have these. The, when you think of a convention, like a fan convention, you think of a big space, exhibit hall space. People stay in hotels around it. They kind of converge in that space and like use the lobbies and stuff like that. Dragon Con is only in hotels. It's in five hotels in downtown Atlanta, which are connected with these sky bridges, but it's 57,000 people in the hotels, five hotels for the week, for the weekend. And so what do they do, right? You can't just stay in your room all day. So the way the hotels are laid out is that they're all atrium-based hotels, like you know the Luxor in Las Vegas. They're all they have giant, you know, you, like the like the tower in Judge Dread, in Dread. Yes, where if you walk to the center, it's all the rooms are facing inward, and it's this giant like forty-seven story, you know, atrium in the center, and you have this big, basically multi-floor plaza area, and everyone just hangs out there. Uh, there are panels, so some people do go to panels. Adam and Jamie they were were there for panels. So I wish I brought my Dragon Con um, uh, guide, the, the book they give you when you first go there, because everything's split into tracks. So if you want to follow a certain track, you can go to these panels or these events. So you have your standard writing track, fantasy novel track, science fiction track. There's an alternate history track where just panels about, let's think about what would happen if, you know, in, if steampunk was real. Or there's a steampunk track. There's an armory track where people talk about guns and swords and, you know, and and, and things like that. There's a puppetry track, a uh, science track, anything that people can get obsessed and, and have fun about. There are at least half a dozen panels throughout the weekend for them, big and small. Um, but mostly, it's just a big party. People get in costume, and it's a huge cosplay convention, and they just put on their costume in the morning, walk around, hang out in the, uh, the, the atriums, and drink 
and ch- catch up with friends they know online and meet people and and just party and it never ends. There's no so, problem drinking in public there. Nope, it's inside well, a hotel, it, so it counts as a bar. Hotels, yeah. Huh. So yeah. what's what's the like? Is this the theme of the con cosplay? No, the theme of the con is being a fan, like f- like a fan of anything. Fan of anything. Okay. And it, are there more people in cosplay than at so Comic Con? F- Comic Con, I think, is 150 or 200 thousand people. Yeah. Percentage wise, I felt out of place not wearing a costume. No kidding. At Dragon really? Con. And there were, you know, people walking around. There are no, like, very few families, but they were, like, but very few, like, the, the gawkers, like, at Comic-Con, there are tons of, like, people, oh, I got, you know, it's more gawkers than fan, than at, costumes. Right. right. At Comic-Con, a great costume walk around, you have, like, 50 people surround them trying to take pictures with their cell phones and whatever. Here, people are just casually walking around in the most elaborate costumes, and it just looks normal. You know what would be amazing is if people in the costume started taking pictures of the gawkers. Like people are like, like you have like a Jack Sparrow and a couple of stormtroopers and a Boba Fett taking a picture of some dude in, in uh, you know, just a pair of jeans and a t-shirt. So what it felt like is these cosplayers were just being themselves in costume. It really felt like it was a space station, right. like a science fiction space station, like Mass Effect. It felt like the Citadel because it was a hotel and it felt like, you know, it, and you had the long elevator weights and everything. And just walking around like, oh, there goes there goes a Krogan. And aliens having conversations exactly. with aliens at, at the bar, right? They're yeah. just at the bar, and like different different like species of characters would would hang out and interact, and then there'd be like the humans walking around, like, oh, look look at that guy over there. A wretched yeah. hive of yeah. scum and villainy. It was it was pretty incredible, and it went on until I mean, at a certain point in the evening when the panels were over, it just turned into a giant rave. So the lights Where? were dim in the atrium. In the atrium, it was just a party, and that's when like the craziest stuff would come out. Um, but there's multiple atriums because you said there's y- yeah, there's, there's but there's the, the Marriott's the big one. So, okay, so, so that's the Marriott that's where the party be, is. That, that's where the party was. Interesting. And, and all the big ballrooms, all the lights were turned out, and people would go dancing. So does it feel like like a dystopian future? Because those hotels always like they're very like late seven mid seventies so dystopian. Uh, no, these are these felt these are pretty clean. I felt really bad for like hotel staff. Oh, it's got to be terrible for them. Yeah. But I mean, they make up. They make the hotels make bank that week, so I'm sure they pass on the the winnings to the employees, right? I'm sure. <laughs> uh, right. Um, my new also, I, I discovered a, a life hack that I don't know if I want to share. So you got to share it. You said it. You got to share bring it. it up, um, yeah, it's the rules. Okay, so Dragon Con's all the elevators are the worst thing. Yeah. And Marriott has uh, those like the staggered elevators. You so mean like, the lines? The lines for the elevators. Yeah. Wow. And, like, really? If you're on the fourth story. You're never going to go up and down because people on the bottom floor are going to take fill it up, and people coming up from the top are going to. So fill you're going to stairs it the whole time. You, no, you want to go down to go up. Well, yeah, you got to go up you, to go down. It's like the it's like that Daft Punk you, song. You like you got to get in a packed <laughs> elevator, let everyone go, you know, go the wrong direction that you want to go, and then finally reach your destination. Um, it would you had to add like 20 minutes to your travel time if you want to go up and down an elevator. So life hack, life hack, service elevators. Service elevators are you always learn, good. You learn the code? No, no code. Learn the Depends entrances. on the hotel. The entrances. Usually they're disguised behind like a, yeah. a door with no lock. So where, where are the, uh, the, the, the people, the cleaning people and the, yeah. all, all the guest services? It's like some doors on floors will just look like doors. And people don't think to open them because if you go in the service elevator, uh, four elevators dedicated and no one will, uh, no one enters them. And I bumped into a few celebrities there i can see why you wouldn't want to share this yeah yeah it could go bad real fast right so so one of the things i liked about comic-con is that when you go to like one of the big hotels the hyatt or the marriott or whatever the staff the week of comic-con all are wearing like slacks and nerd t-shirts they they did this happen at dragon con where like people wearing costumes no no well see so i talked to one of the couple of people at at the hotel we stayed at in comic-con this year and and they were like, yeah, this is our favorite week of the year because normally we they have to wear suits everywhere they go, and you know, so getting to wear t-shirts and like jeans is a, is a big like they get excited about it. Um, but the Dragon Con folks weren't wearing like Klingon costumes or anything. Absolutely not. What were the what were the so what what are the easy costumes that you see at Dragon Con? Like, did you like because you know you see a lot of and I'm not saying that stormtroopers are easy because those costumes are expensive and all that but there's a wide range of quality in like stormtrooper armor. I didn't armor. see anyone in like a clear store bought Halloween costume, like a lot of people in Comic Con. You do. mean like slutty Supergirl, which you, you see at Comic Con a lot or something? Yeah, like that. yeah. Pe- everything looked either high end they bought or something people made. 
uh, at least that I could tell. And so I met a ton of people that I knew online. Um, like, like cosplay people? Cosplay people and, and, and makers and prop makers. Uh, Bill Doran, who's a Punish Props from Seattle. Uh, he made the Mass Effect gun that we mm-hmm. gave away last year for Octobercast. Auction. Uh, he, uh, he was there, and it was amazing because he, he made this uh, Skyrim um, Death Lord armor for him and his wife. Uh, Dragum. Dra- Draugr. Draugr. Draugr, whatever. Yeah. yeah, I don't know how you pronounce that. Um, have you played Skyrim? Not enough. Okay, so so it's it's a, it's a great elaborate. You know these these warlords died and they, they're ghosts and they're they're, they look like mummified mummified ice skeletons, right? Basically, um, he was there and that was his big costume with him and his wife, and we're walking around with him, and suddenly this claptrap walks up to him. So it's a, a like claptrap from Borderlands, like a puppet or a robot. It, it was kind of like a puppet on wheels, and s- someone wearing a black bodysuit behind it was puppeteering him. And Bill goes, that's amazing. That's a great claptrap. Let's take a picture with it. Uh, I, I've wanted to build one of these for, for months now. And the guy who, uh, who, who was manipulating Puppet here took off his, um, his hood for the black suit. And it was Bill's twin brother who he didn't know was going to be there. And it looked just dun, like dun, Bill dun. And my mind was like. Pfft. They really didn't know, that he, they didn't know they were going to be there? They did not know. His, 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 all his friends and family hid it from him. And he built that claptrap. Oh, that's hysterical. And, and surprise his twin brother at Dragon Con. That's amazing. So stuff like that. Uh, at night, the crazy, um, there's a lot of groups that, like, people who dress up in groups. Um, there were just people, like, a, a mob of people hang out on the side of a, the hotel, call themselves the, uh, the Brohans, um, the riders of Brohan. So, so like, are they? Like, 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 like Rohan, they had a flag and everything, but they all had, like, glasses and pop collars and gave out swag. And then they like stood there for half an hour and then moved to a different spot and played their music. There were people who just wore like the, the horse masks, like the like weird like the, like animal masks, not just horses, but like chickens and goats. Unicorns. With, and with like, with um, Oh, that's jock. Hotline Miami, dude. Yeah, it was Hotline Miami. Yeah. yeah. So it was a Hotline Miami group. The Hotline um, Miami was super popular at PAX this year. I'd never, like tons of those guys. It was just like partying, just like, it was, it was crazy. The, the nerd in me is just wondering, but what about the panels? The panels were good. The did ones you, I attended. Uh, Joey attended a couple of panels and so did Wes. Um, what are the pan- what are the topics? Well, like I said, every track has a bunch of panels. So, for uh, I'll give you an example, uh, the ones I attended because Adam was there. He did a panel panel with Veronica Belmont and Phil Plate, the bad astronomer, and that was about how to communicate science on TV and on Twitter and in popular media. Um, there was a panel. That was good. I saw that. Yeah, and, and there was a panel on you know I wanted to go to about like designing puppets for TV, so you know they have experts at every level, um, just sharing knowledge, and people get to talk to them afterward. Um, I met uh, up with uh, Frank Abilito, who's a, a mask maker. He made Adam's Akbar mask. Yeah. At Comic Con, which is amazing. Um, and he made his own Akbar mask for himself, and he wore a, a he borrowed a Darth Vader armor. So he was Admiral. It was Darth Akbar. Darth yeah. Akbar, and with with the hands, <laughs> Darth too, Admiral, like, uh, and choking people. Yeah, as Akbar. I, I um, I'm bummed you didn't get get to see him on the floor. I'd be interested. I just to got see some how that photos, went. but I didn't see him walk around and and interact with people. But he wasn't even like the most noticeable, like cosplayer, because there were so many more like yeah. crazy elaborate costumes. Well, well, there's so. Should we spoil the incog? No, nah, that's that's wait. okay. Yeah, yeah, like so, like. At Comic Con, the Adam when Adam brings one of his costumes, something that he spent hundreds of hours on, that's that's better than film quality a lot of times. Like he really stands out because the stuff that he's wearing is much better than like looks really polished at a level that a lot of the other costumes don't. From the pictures I saw from Norm's gallery from Dragon Con, like his stuff blends right in would blend right in there, uh, from a quality pure quality level. It's really amazing. So yeah, any any other? So that was that was Dragon Con. Um, we also uh, outside of Dragon Con did a couple other videos, um, which will be on the site. We uh, are you know, having fun with our needler project. So we commissioned a uh, a Halo n- needler um, prop replica to to be made, and we got finally got to see that in person and and do a video with that, and that's actually coming uh, next week. Um, and then we also stopped by a a, a, a guy who does uh, very cool restoration. I'm not going to tell exactly what type of restoration he does, but he does uh, like There's nothing mil- people military love more. hardware restoration, which is awesome. A- antique stuff. Um, sounds good. Uh, I'm going to play some music, and then we'll we'll I guess talk about technology. We good? 
Yeah. Anything else? I'm sure there are many It'll things. It'll come up, I'm sure. Here we go. Okay. Who does your music? Uh, Phil Reno. All right. Phil is Waffle Stomp on Giant Bomb. He did the Giant Bomb themes. He's working on a new theme for us right oh, now. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. Um, maybe two. We might do one. I, I, I kind of... Like, you As a dude who makes music and has made music for podcasts, what is your thought on music for podcasts versus not music? Because we don't have a theme for Still Untitled right now. At the top? What are you talking about? Yeah. The, yeah like, I, I think like, it's great. I like a little music at the beginning of a show, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as long as you start with the vocal, you know, come in with yeah, some Hey, kind guys, of it's blah, blah, blah. Yep. And it's... Tight, tight, snappy. Yeah, I'm a fan. Forty five seconds. Yep, and out. Um, it feels great. He he's like a musical chameleon. If you say, "Hey, I want, I want something that sounds like Daft Punk cycled through Bach," he'll come up with something, and it's like, "Yeah, okay, that's exactly it." <laughs> um, should we t- let's start with Balmer. Balmer is the big big news of the last two weeks. I think if you look at Microsoft, who I would say it's fair to describe as beleaguered, despite making a shitload of money. They haven't had success in the new markets that they've moved into over the last 10 years, with the exception of Xbox. Um, and and uh, a lot of people blame Balmer, and we're going to find out real soon, the next year or two, whether that was, he was the problem. Because he announced that he is retiring um, within the next 12 months. Well, Retiring from being a CEO. Retiring from being CEO. Of Microsoft. Of Microsoft. You were saying you feel sorry for Balmer. I, you know... But, so Balmer's been at Microsoft since the very beginning. Like he was Not, the uh, well, yes. almost One of the early since, early employees. Since Harvard. Yeah, he was. He, but he, he, was, he, he didn't co-found it. it. But he was well, one of the, one yeah, of the very first. From employees. the time that yes. Microsoft mattered yes. on, yes. Balmer was there. Okay. Um, he was the first person who did sales for them. Like he has been the Microsoft sales guy from the very from essentially the beginning. Norm's right. It wasn't the very very beginning, but um, so so Bill retired in what like two thousand two two thousand three. Uh, Bill Gates. I shouldn't. I shouldn't yep. first name Bill Gates. Um, and then Balmer stood up, stood up to be the the CEO. And it felt like you know this is Balmer's moment to shine. And and then he became kind of a punchline on the internet, which we've yeah. He was the punchline long before. He, yeah, that. okay. Devel- developers, developers, developers was the beginning of Balmer as a punchline, I think, because he's a big sweaty guy and he came on stage and started screaming about how important developers were, and it just made him look like a fucking lunatic. Let's just get right out and yep. okay. Um, since then, since since Gates left, you know, my Xbox launched in what 2000, 2001? end of two thousand, early two thousand one. Sounds right. Um, Three sixty came out. It was transitional as Balmer took over, and. Um, then they basically ceded all of their phone market share uh, in the transition from Windows Mobile to, to Windows Phone. Uh, it had two, basically two years off from selling any phones, have completely whiffed on the tablet thing, and Windows is Windows and the PC in general are kind of receding um, as general as like the, the basic entry level general purpose computing device. And Microsoft doesn't have any answers. Now they're still making a shitload of money with both Windows and Office and the server stuff and their cloud stuff. Um, Bing is pretty much always going to be, like the general consensus is that Bing has no hope of ever overtaking Google as the as the search engine of choice. Um, so so like his his reign as CEO of Microsoft is the guy who turned Microsoft into IBM. That's his legacy at this point. But he, that was like the majority of what he did in terms of revenue. Yeah. Now their device is a service company, and that was all him, too. That, that also is all him. It may end up being great. We're not going to know that for, I mean, for they, a while. They, are yeah. now, they, they had two options after the rise of Apple and mobile, um, was to go enterprise, full IBM, or to... Well, f- IBM went services, just be clear. But they so, went enterprise, enterprise services. services, which yeah. is where a lot of money is. Yeah. Um, where Microsoft is still in, yeah. uh, or they could do devices and, and actually fight the fight. Yeah, so um, the devices and services strategy that he mentioned in the in the goodbye letter makes a lot more sense now uh, when we see the other big news of the last two weeks, which is that Microsoft's buying Nokia for... Nokia. S- Nokia. So wait, uh, let's talk about the Balmer. They all about, go together, right. I think. Balmer is going to be gone in within 12 months. Yeah. The board has talked about uh, they're looking for actively looking there's for a, external internal candidates. There's to a CEO them. committee, finding committee. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. As is always there is the no, case. There is no plan uh, like, like with Apple. 
Yeah, um, but that was no obviously di- different. Succession that was a plan. little easier to plan. Well, that, that was and also harder for the same reasons. Yes, exactly. Uh, different circumstances. Yeah. Um, Balmer's doing interviews right now. You know, w- with their chairman, and they're there. He's talking, and he, he's in, he sounds like he's in spirits. What is unclear is whether this was the board asking him to leave. I I have to imagine. The, in the way that they negotiate, the way that this happened without a successor to, because the ideal when you do this kind of thing is that the board comes in and says, Steve's retiring at the end of this year. His replacement is the same way they did with Bill. Retired. They said, hey, well, Bill, Bill, Bill Gates is retiring but he was, in 2003. He, wasn't CEO. he was, he was, when he stopped being CEO, no, then. No, no, no. He, I, I'm, I don't know. What, what's your question? Bill is still a big part of the company. Bill is the chairman of the board. So Bill is the primary shareholder, chairman of the board. They run a lot of big decisions through him. He's not involved in day to day. For a while, he was like chief technologist right. too. We're not going to have Balmer doing keynotes anywhere. You're like not going to have did. Balmer to kick around anymore. But he's not going to be present after Microsoft in any capacity. It's unclear. Like, like he's still Bill a big was. shareholder, like, like Bill was when he, like when he left. Yes. For several years. After. There was a, it's difficult to say when Bill Gates retired because there was a transitional period that seemed like it was like five years long, but it was probably only three. Um, it, ideally, in this situation, you have somebody come out and say, hey, we're, uh, uh, Balmer's retiring. Here's his successor. We have a plan, blah, blah, blah. This is all perfectly choreographed and, and well planned. When they say, hey, we're going to find somebody in the next 12 months, either that means they're going to start looking at external candidates in a big way, which is something you kind of can't keep secret. Or uh, they they the board just got fed up with Bomber's inability three point seven percent market share on Windows Phone it was like dude well time they, to they, move they did the Marissa Meyer thing pretty pretty secretly did you read that big story in Business yes. Insider yes about how they how she got that job but that's because they knew that they wanted Marissa oh, they didn't want Marissa she she well wanted. she came out and said hey and then once she said hey I would like this job then it was an easy decision for them right not an easy decision she had to fight for it. Well, okay, and, and but she impressed the hell out of them. But it, that wasn't and, and like that they was went out on a search. I guess they, is what they, I'm saying. they were going because. But right. everybody knew okay. they were. Go- they didn't have a secret search. What I'm saying is, it's hard to have a secret search, external. Right. Everybody knew that there was no that they needed a new Yahoo CEO. Well, they had the interim CEO. Yes. As you, if the board wanted him out. Well, there are also uh, you know activist investors who are trying to get on the board. Um, it's all very dark night rises, isn't it? <laughs> Yes, it all comes back to a comic book movie from last summer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Who's Lucius Fox in this one? Is Bill Gates Lucius Fox? Bill Gates is Lucius Fox in okay. this scenario, and what you don't want is Daggett taking over Microsoft. Daggett's Balmer, right? No. Uh, Daggett yeah, is laying the, the bombs all over the city, and we want is a uh, Italia or uh, what's her name? Um, By the way, there's probably going to be Dark Knight spo- Rises spoilers here in just a second. Yeah. Um. Anyway, Bomber's Bane, the Business Week story, not the Business Week story, the All Things D story about the rise strongly suggests that Bomber was was run out of town or it was asked to leave. I um, think it's more. I mean, yes, the next CEO will be important, but someone I forget who it was wrote a great story about why it's more important that they replace the board it, opinions and faces on the board, uh, especially with people who are tied who have who Microsoft have invested in, for example. Uh, like Facebook, like getting Zuckerberg on the board on the board of Microsoft might not be a bad getting idea. Getting the Youngs on bo- on the board, yeah. Uh, Drew Houston, yeah. Uh, CEO of Dropbox, is like two, it's like young, two years younger than me or something. Um, what have you done with your life, Chen? Nothing much. Um, the the big thing that the other thing that was super interesting to me about this whole Bomber story is the way that they do performance. It explains so much about Microsoft, but the way they do performance evaluations or did. For a long time, it's unclear if they're still doing this, but it's a system that they call stack ranking, um, and I think some other companies use it as well. Uh, Cisco came up in a conversation I maybe shouldn't talk about in the podcast, but um, the idea is that if you are in a team of people, the average everybody there, there's a good raise. There was an episode of news radio about this years ago, but the idea is that it ha- your your rankings have to be average. So if you have three people on a team and they're all really good, you have two choices. You can give the worst of the three people a below average ranking, the middle one an average ranking, and the good one an above average ranking, or you can just give them all average rankings. So what this does is it discourages people from going to teams that are full of smart people who are really hard workers and are very smart. And 
it also discourages you from going to it encourages you to go someplace where where you, there's a shitload of people and you're more likely to be better than than the average it seemed really damaging and bad and also secret so the way like the theoretical end of year performance review is that you go in your your boss goes into a room with his boss and all the other people that 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 your boss reports to that your boss's boss have as reports and among all of those people everything has to end up average regardless of the of the performance of the individual subgroups and all sorts of weird shit like that and also you're not supposed to tell anybody that this is happening it seemed really really like this is of one where every every division is at odds with every other division and there's a lot of internal competition. now they're one microsoft yeah we'll see how that goes so what what does the timing of that whole reorg have to do is this Bomber's last big push before he has to no, the has to last step big aside? Push is, is Nokia, or is this so? Th- is th- this is big... this the last straw that sent the board over the edge? Right, there are two things. No, I don't think it's the last straw. I think the one the one Microsoft was a, the reorg was a good thing. You can't. They couldn't have done. He couldn't have done that without the board's knowledge, right? And yes, and the, the one Microsoft reorg plus the now no now we know the, the Nokia Nokia um, deal. They don't. They haven't bought Nokia. They've bought certain parts of Nokia. Um, which has been going on, I think, for a year now. The talks for yeah um, started at World Mobile Congress, I think, in Barcelona. Barcelona last yeah. year. Uh, those things. There's two ways to think about it. One that Bomber wanted to do those things to push his devices and services strategy forward and give himself a, one last chance to bring Microsoft back, or that those things were not enough to push him out or to save him, and that that's his, his legacy is out of his hands now you guys have you seen the the uh, lumia yeah the, the 1120 uh, yeah. yeah 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 it's supposed to be amazing it's supposed to be a nice it's really hardware. big it's got it's a carl zeiss big. lens it's supposed to be take better photos than an iphone yeah, i does. absolutely believe that yeah. because of uh, the big sensor in there that 41 megapixel tr- pure view yeah but uh having used the, the first lumia like the the nine 920s or the, the 800s mm-hmm. the ones that were like that matte i want that size yeah um, the new ones, little pl- slick plastic and c- kind of a little too big. The problem that they're facing is that it doesn't matter of the popular of the more popular stuff, but then there's big weird holes and like the games are kind of it's like it's just so you don't see this. It's like going to you know how you go late Labor Day hmm. uh, that they would spend seven point one billion dollars to acquire Nokia's a uh, handset division. Yeah, offshore money, so they were able to save quite a bundle. That's what I understand. No taxes, right? That'd be a hell of a, a sales lot, tax. Lot of cash, uh, influx of cash, to help help prop up Nokia, which will still operate as a company, um, and they, will still own its patents, and they, they will sell low end like candy bar phones in so other parts of the world. Did they did they buy the manufacturing stuff too, they or did they just the buy stuff, all the smartphone manufacturing? So stuff. so okay, so Nokia, Finnish Nokia owns feature phones. A whole bunch of patents, including some Qualcomm stuff and some other things, and manufacturing, smartphone manufacturing, yeah. Lumia manufacturing, Lumia, the the new finished plan last year. And Microsoft has that now. Microsoft has rights to uh, Nokia's patent portfolio for ten years, access to all their Maps services and code for that without explicitly owning that stuff. Nokia will run its Map services company, which they launched last year. Uh, what was it called like Here or something? Here now or Here Go or um, something like that. And that they're going to license that out to other or still. So others, that could uh, conceivably show up on Android and yes. maybe iOS, but probably. And they'll still have their patents, so they can still sue and t- take in royalties. Uh, but it seems like uh, the question is, well, so Microsoft why did, did Microsoft need to buy Nokia if Nokia was on, basically already only making Windows phones? So, well, because Nokia's success in the Windows phone market, while they own what seventy-five or eighty percent of Windows phone market share, that's still only under four percent of. So what 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 changes when Microsoft share. is now? What about the argument that they can now do what Apple does and have synergy between they can't. the hardware and the software? Well, well, we'll get to that in a second. But just because Microsoft now controls that, and there's a lot of overlap, and the, the point is that they get rid of some of the overlapping stuff. So Microsoft engineers and Nokia engineers are now. Same engineers, and they're not doing things differently, and then collaborating. So one person is handing software to a different company overseas. It's this one, the one company. Um, well, it also means that that things like the like Nokia did a great maps that Here Go Maps stuff is really good, and if Microsoft can provide that to whatever third party Windows Phone providers remain, that'll be good. I, I so think that, is that worth seven billion dollars? 
I, if, I don't know what's I, seven billion dollars is an amount of money that I can't comprehend. Uh, the question you have, Jeremy, is that is it a as some people have said an Apple like strategy and to some extent Google like strategy, less like Google of acquiring your own um, mobile hardware company yeah. while you also develop an OS. Apple is very very special case uh, because they have always been that company. They made they make the mistake of licensing Mac OS out to people who could make build their own power PC. Power PCs. Yeah. Stop that. But they cemented their hardware platform top to bottom strategy when they were still the underdog and they yep. were st- providing ground up. Yeah, gr- build, yep. building the business out of that. And they still. You're are, saying you can't do it this you, late? You can't do it. Well, especially not on the Windows side. Uh, maybe on the Windows Phone side, because. The number, there's you, no market. There's no market. You can yeah. own that. You can you can make a better experience for your small, and there are a lot of Windows Phone fans right. out there. But, but that would require starting over with either the hardware or the software? Well, no. They're, I think they're flexible enough that they they can converge. Yeah. Um, but they're not doing that either because they're still licensing Windows Phone out to OEMs. I, dude, who is realistically going to buy it, license? I mean, HTC will release one does, device a year. doesn't matter if they don't. the OEMs don't buy it, but the fact that they have to still develop Windows Phone platform so that it will work on any that's not a, that's not it's not it's a non-issue because they'll say look they'll do the same thing they did with the first version of windows phone they'll say here is the platform for windows phone it's this cpu this screen resolution which they broaden that blah, out blah. for windows phone 8. i know and then they'll tighten it back in for whatever nokia whatever so they do with the, the nokia only devices. way they can have that is if they tighten it to a point where you're only making where windows the, the fact that you have development resources software resources to accommodate OEMs that aren't even going to put good hardware on your on your software. It's not going to be a problem in two years. Then they should just cut it off and only let. If they Nokia. did that, people would have flipped out and investors would have been pissed. Yeah. It's no, I, I think the investors would have been totally happy because then they would believe in that the Apple I, the Apple one company top down control. The important thing to remember is that partners on phone are also partners on PC. Samsung is so, a large partner on PC. HTC not so much. Uh, like they can, what Microsoft can't do is do for Windows Phone what they did for Surf, Windows 8 with the Surface. They you mean can't, fuck it up? Well, no, they can't specifically. They can't say that this is the, the model we're going to build because we control hardware and software now. Our Lumia phones, whatever they call them, they won't be called Nokia phones. They'll be called Microsoft Surface phones or whatever. Uh, they can't say this is the, the, the model that we want OEMs and partners to inspire them and to push them Why forward, not? push the platform forward. Because it didn't work with the Surface. Well, that's because they fucked up the Surface. Because if they make a nice phone, then that's a whole different thing. No, I think the Surface hardware was nice. It was the Windows 8 that was bad. It was too big. They launched a 10-inch huge tablet when the whole industry was moving towards 7-inch tablets. And I think they'll do a 7-inch tablet also. I think that's a great idea. So you guys are kind of suggesting the best of... Google, Google, and Apple. Where well, Google's completely different because Motorola is so separate. From Motor- Google. Motorola it doesn't count. Zero, zero preference. So the Nexus is the is the example, not the Motorola stuff. Yeah, Nexus is what Microsoft wanted to do with the Surface. You're, but I'm saying they have complete and control over the hardware, and they license out designs. They don't have Google doesn't have complete control over the hardware. They own it. No, on no, paper. But, but they, that, I'm saying they license out the the OS. But they license out completely. Yeah. Right. I, I, Apple and Google. Are Opposite, complete opposite ends of the spectrum right. mm. in the same way that on the PC desktop side it's Windows. So I'm and saying Microsoft crosses both of those circles. Yes, and because they're in the middle, they lose because they can't commit one way or the other. Ah. Well, I think it's safe. I think betting Microsoft is going to lose is probably safe at this point. <laughs> they, they lose faster. It's, it's really? Not, they, they, they're, they're, they're not gonna, it's not going to save them. Wow. Um, I, I, here's the thing. It's still, even though everything feels really congealed, for lack of a better term, in phones and tablets, it's nothing is certain. Every two years, every, every single person, every two to, f- say, four years, everybody who has a phone makes a purchasing decision, and things can change dramatically, as evidenced by an HTC One sitting on your desk, Norm. Yeah, and um, Android's great. Right. Every, every two years there's an opportunity to capture new people. What Microsoft and anybody else who wants to increase market share in phones and tablets, has to, phones especially, has to do is figure out what can we do, what do people want enough to overcome inertia when that two-year window is up? And to date, they, they have shown something that is very comparable but kind of less good for reasons that are mostly outside their control, app ecosystem and stuff like that, 
than the competition. What they need to do is is do what they're doing with the with the new Lumia phone and say, hey, we can actually put a really fucking awesome camera on this device. If they can get the other stuff as good as the competition and do one or two things that are better, then then it gives I them think, an opportunity. I think the one or two things can't be in the hardware. I, I think hardware is very important, but the uh, software is software is key. Software is what makes so makes or breaks experience. Yeah. On the Apple side, uh, it is it's again very unique scenario where the hardware is tied to the software and the software is great because they have the control of the hardware that's why your iphone 5 is a dual core phone that's that's how you get the battery life it's how you get the size down it's how they make more profits on it right because they can get that performance out of a dual core phone because they control that stack um on the android side it's all still software yes the oems will you tart it up with with their fancy hardware bits with whatever megapixel camera and 1080p screens. Do you use the Beats a lot, Norm? Uh, you know what? The audio actually sounds really good. Okay. So, um, uh, what what is appealing about Google and the reason I switch is because tied to software services, because I use Google everywhere else in my life, and because this is tied so well to Google services, it's better experience than the iPhone for Gmail, Drive, and all the, then Google Search and Google Now. I think, you know what, I think it's gonna improve with iOS 7, just as an aside, because they will, that you can now have uh, downloads connected to push events. So, for instance, with the um, Gmail app right now, I can get a push event that I have a new email, but if I launch it, the email hasn't downloaded yet, it has to come in, it's, yeah. it's a pain in the butt. Same thing for but TweetDeck. They're changing that, so I think it's gonna get better. Um, for me, it's every single time that the G Google Maps or Google Search app logs me out for no apparent reason, and I have to two-factor back into that, I'm a little closer to switching to Android. Um, but on the Microsoft side, if you follow that line of thinking, it is gonna be the, the Microsoft platform as a whole. If Windows 8, was great and people love Windows 8, that would make getting a Windows phone that much easier and that much more appealing because you can tie in all the services. Because Google services are great because I cannot live without them, that made switching Android that much easier and make, made me much more like open to using their notification system yeah. and all the stuff that's unique to that platform. Because I use a MacBook and there's a lot of tie-in with PhotoStream and stuff like that, that's why I used the iPad before and the iOS I, before. The Apple's divorce from Google is the thing that's frustrated me most about the OS. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and Microsoft stands alone, and they, they do tie into Google services like every other platform does, but their other stuff. Well, they I mean, don't. SkyDrive. There's calendar problems right. and stuff like Sky that. SkyDrive and their other Microsoft services are not compelling enough right now, and Windows 8 is experienced, and the Metro apps are not compelling enough right now. That was, it was a really solid plan. Well, if they'd launched it two years earlier, it would have been great. And it just didn't fall through. It what did, was it? Somebody didn't pan out. Matt Buchanan on Twitter said, from who's from the New Yorker Tech Channel or something, said, when when the director of Microsoft of Microsoft's PR said, vice president of, of PR said, "Hey, what should we be? What should if you're so smart? What should we, we should be? Should, ah, if you're so smart, what should we be doing?" And he said exactly what you're doing now, but just five years ago. And that's exactly it. They're they're like when they were embracing phones, they should have been just skipping phones and going straight to tablets. Because if they had made a good tablet to compete with the iPad two, then they then that could have driven people into the ecosystem from another way. They, There's just no yeah. compelling reason to start right now. At Microsoft has never been that forward thinking. They've always relied on the time, the luxury of the time to iterate in order well, to make their products good. Well, and the fact that they had a massive Windows monopoly to, to, to even, leverage. But, yes, but even Windows took years before it became something that people actually enjoyed. I mean, you know, That's true. you don't even remember Windows 1, you know, and, and or w Windows 95 was a turning point. Right. Really, Windows 98, if you want to really get honest But it took about a long it. time, and even with each release, even with Windows 8 now, you had to wait till 8.1 before people actually really appreciated it. Well, and it seems like they, they need that time to iterate, and there's just not that kind of time in the mobile space. But, but more than that, like when, I, when we were talking to Microsoft in the lead up to Windows 8, it seemed like their strategy was, hey, everybody's got to upgrade to this anyway because it's Windows, and that's going to just push a bunch of people into our app store, so there will automatically be a market for that without even... Con and it didn't work because nobody wanted to use Metro apps on, on PCs that are connected to monitors and desktops. So why do you think that Microsoft might be looking to buy a PC manufacturer? So here's the thing. If, if the Nokia purchase works well and they grow market share and things start to improve and they see... And how, they, how, like, how, how would... Like, under what strategy? What do you mean? Under, under what ideal strategy? I'm saying if purchasing Nokia as a way to expand the devices and services strategy, 
which is what the what what so like, purchasing Nokia what, is. What, what what success model are you talking about? Like, well, like, I think success for Microsoft with regards to Nokia is increasing. Right now, market share for Windows phones is three point seven five percent. So just regardless of whether it's if only, they can get fifteen percent of phones market, or whether they redo a licensing if, model, like if Windows Phone market share improves compared to Android and iOS. That's that's I mean that that's that's a goal. Yes, yes, that would be great. But un, under I mean, if you're gonna say buy a hardware company as a model, what is the implementation that you're? Saying? I don't have any idea. I'm not a Microsoft executive, and I didn't spend seven billion dollars. So your to logic buy Nokia. is, if you buy a hardware company and but I'm good things happen, then you want to buy hardware. What company. I'm telling, what I'm saying is, the way I have seen Microsoft work over the last twenty years is that if they try something and it works, then they apply that to other aspects of their business that fairly is, consistently. That is a terrible. I, I don't, the Xbox was internal, and that's their biggest success ever. Not really. It's 10%. I mean, yes, it is their biggest consumer success besides Windows and Office, but it's 10% of their revenue or less. I don't think, I, I don't think that that model applies. And You don't think? No, I don't think the model of if you do something for a different part of your company that works, you're going to do same the same exact thing for a different part of the company. They clearly they clearly look at um, the surface is clearly a hey if the ecosystem's not going to do what we want then we're just going to do it ourselves. That is a that is a clear thought that happened at some point inside Microsoft because they were looking at what the OEMs were coming up with and none oh, of it satisfied. So, okay, let's we'll use Surface as the model. Okay, and it seems like if they were ever to look at buying another hardware company, it would be to expand the Surface model to something at scale where it would be a significant portion of... Right, so if their plan is to build tablets running desktop windows, real windows, not Regardless of tablets, ARM windows tablet. or whatever. Well, no, no, but I mean, if you're looking at where their hole is right now, they have PC sales, they're good there, although that's declining. They, they have a strategy for phones. The tablet strategy seems a little bit soft from where I'm sitting. Like that Nokia does tablets. Nokia has done tablets in the past. Nokia will do the Surface tablets, but they're Windows Phone tablets. They're ARM based, and I don't think people are going to be I spending a lot of money on Windows ARM stuff. Phone tablets. They're, I, I they're, think, sorry, they're Windows RT tablets, not Windows Phone tablets. Is my understanding. I haven't seen a Nokia tablet. I have no idea. But I, from all indication, Nokia is going to play that role because to, for building those tablets. So, so the thing about the thing, the question is really. Are they buying Nokia because they want to control hardware manufacturing and be able to build really slick, really exciting devices that are going to get people on board because theoretically there was some deficiency on that before? Or are they just buying a phone company so that somebody keeps making Windows phones? I think it's more the latter right now. Yeah. I mean, I, I was my hope is that they think that they can do something better than what Nokia was doing by themselves. I don't think there's um, any chance Microsoft's going to buy a Dell or an HP or a Lenovo. They can't afford a Lenovo. Dell's pretty cheap. They can't afford a Lenovo. Asus is out of their price range. HP is available. There's no point. It brings nothing to the table. I think that that's five years off at Bring, minimum. Brings, those, are, those are not a tablet known for... Ta they don't have... Well, the other thing is, if the, if the PC market continues to erode, then they're going to have to make some sort of move to staunch that. And if that means that they make they buy somebody who can make devices that are like Lenovo, that are nice hybrids of PCs and tablets things like the yoga, then then that becomes a thing that it's worth spending money on or buying into or partnerships or whatever. I think just like the early Nokia deal, it's better to enter a partnership where someone, where you pay zero dollars to get good good hardware. Do you think they, well, they didn't pay zero dollars for the Nokia deal. For the the deal for Nokia to to just do Windows Phone? Yeah. That was zero dollars. For co-marketing and all that stuff. Money, uh. money transferred. Um, do you think Elop was a sleeper sell? Did they mentoring in candidate Nokia? Because he came in, the stock price was what, like three, four times what it is at the time they announced the purchase? I think if you look at the history of what Elop does, I think it was more motivated. It was, if anything, he wanted to do it, not Microsoft. And they. So, he, Jeremy, he, Stephen Elop was the CEO of Nokia. Look, there's other people in the world who don't know who Elop is. <laughs> he was, he was I a, bet two of them listen to your podcast. Um, Stephen Elop, before uh, he was CEO at Nokia, he was at Microsoft for three years running their business division, and he was including Office. Boston Market or something before, before that, right? Before he was at Microsoft, uh, he was running, uh, he was a president of Adobe. Adobe Systems, not CEO, just a president. And yeah. he was president of Adobe because he was a CEO of Macromedia, and he sold Macromedia to Adobe 
Thanks, Flash. And then before that, I think he was at like Juniper Networks or maybe around there. And then, yes, at some point in his life, he also ran Boston Market. Or was it Marie Callender's? No, it was Boston Market. Boston Market? Market? Okay. It was Boston Market. Um, so would he make a good Microsoft so CEO? So what it looks well, like from uh, his uh, history is that he moves from place to place, and he has a history of also uh, selling out, moving up. Generating shareholder revenue and then moving up at an appropriate time. Because if you look at when when... Macromedia sold to Adobe. They got out at the like that was the peak of value for Macromedia as a company. Yeah, good timing. Because yeah, Flash wasn't going to get more valuable, and and uh, uh, WYSIWYG HTML editors are not super popular these days in in most professional circles. So, like everybody came out as soon as the Nokia thing was announced. It was like, oh, Elop's got to be the leading contender for the Balmer seat. And I, I just, I mean, he doesn't have a real great like. He has a great record for him. Doesn't seem. I mean, I guess he made a lot of money for Microsoft at the, in the businesses division. I That's think he the is one definitely place a contender. That he has a, a very, very strong contender, uh, given his familiarity with both Microsoft culture and the business operations in terms of office stuff, the money making stuff, and also experience in uh, in getting product launches out on the hardware side at Nokia. Yeah, I mean, say what you will, and and say what you will about Adobe. At least they're reliable on software releases. I mean, they update something every year hell or high water um i don't know i think we've talked about nokia and microsoft enough uh, i had one less last i was looking at an ad for the lumia phones at the same time i was reading a rumor story about colored iphone cheap iphones and it made me wonder if if inexpensive iphones with colors and plastic backs is a is a direct hit direct swipe at Nokia no. and the and Absolutely the bright colored phones. Uh, no, it's, it, it is. And it, historically, Apple has always done the multicolor thing. Well, since 2000. Histor- in, in, in mobile, in iOS yeah. and, and iPod. So abs- not a knock. They will take away, they will compete for the same customers, but it's not like they're doing it just to spite Microsoft. Uh, speaking of which, Apple, uh, Apple has an event next week, September 10th. Yeah. Tuesday. We'll we ex- weren't invited again. I don't know what's up with that. Really? It's uh, hard to believe. The question is whether it will be live streamed. Probably um, not. Yeah, well, they just did the last one that yep. way. It's been years that since they did. That was WWDC. And WWDC is for developers, and they can't get people. They, they sell out in 35 seconds or whatever. Yeah. So typically, WWDC is always streamed. But they didn't have to. They get things get, I mean, that, oh, no. that was their choice. That's you know, true. They just did it because they we'll wanted to. We'll find out likely the day before or the morning of yeah. whether it will be streamed. Uh, we'll expect the iPhone f- next uh, f- follow-up. Uh, we'll expect uh, cheaper iPhones, plastic back iPhones. And uh, the new rumor this week is that we'll expect a new Apple TV. That wouldn't surprise me at all, given the update. I mean, they, the, further down the list, there's there have been two big Apple TV updates earlier this year. One that added ESPN, an app for ESPN. The HBO Go update came out this year. They just added Disney Channel Weather and I think Smithsonian or something weird, and maybe maybe something from the U- some channel from the UK that I'd never heard of before. And increasingly, the fall holiday season is the time for people to gift and buy a set top boxes. Yeah, I think that's uh, a fifty to ninety nine dollars set top box is a lovely gift for the person that you don't know what to give them for Christmas. Yeah, I I don't know what they could add to the Apple TV at this point that wouldn't be a lot more important. You know, like if unless they start adding storage and an app store, then I don't know what they're going to add. It's already ten eighty p. It's plenty fast. It's quiet. It's small. I think an app store is probably the the obvious add. Well, that's a huge deal then. Yeah. Well, it could I mean, be. I don't think they'll do that at this event. This is an iPhone event. That that's too big a deal to release. You think they'll, yeah, they're doing a separate. Uh, probably doing a separate iPad event. The rumor yeah. is that there's a separate yeah. iPad event. And I think that's because they don't know whether they can get the yields on Retina iPad Mini. I think uh, for this Christmas. I think this yeah. might be a Maverick. Well, we'll definitely see iOS seven released on September tenth. It seems yeah. like, um, maybe Mavericks as well. And that might be delay further back on uh, tablet development. They may not release iOS seven to be on yeah. developers. They might wait till the phone's out. The dev version weeks, of right. iOS 7 is pretty... The, right. they, they haven't updated it in not, two weeks it's now. It's not the gold release, though. It's, it's not the gold release, but it's, it is... It's solid. It is very usable yep. at this point. Um, uh, it doesn't surprise you. I mean, I know we're getting leaks every single cycle now with Apple, more than we used to, but it seems like this cycle has been more than ever. They have to make so many of them, so many of those devices now in order to fulfill the early demand. Well, you're talking there's, specifically there's, about just how many of the candy-coated shells have come out yep yeah the cases like people are holding up the new ipad uh, mini next to the new ipad and it's just like they're doing this with impunity it's just like people on youtube look what i got well there's nobody steve's amazing. not there to threaten to kill people anymore 
<laughs> I'm going to come to your house with the police you know, and kick the door in. Yeah, but, you know, it just seems surprising that there's not more you know, double downing it's, on Are secrecy. you Apple fan 248 <laughs> on Mac rumors? I'm kicking the balls. Yeah. Um, uh, I think Lee over at ours wrote a... Was it Lee? No. That wrote the thing about Google Play as the platform for Android now. Uh, somebody at ours, Technica, wrote a great piece earlier this week about... Maybe it was last week even, about Google Play being the new platform for Android. Uh, in meaning that the point releases for Android updates matter not a whit anymore because they're just adding low-level hardware support and things like Bluetooth low energy profiles and stuff like this. There's a chopper overhead or something, I think. Um, Bluetooth low energy, like support for new kinds of hardware and new low-level protocols and stuff like that. And then all of the actual interesting stuff that people care about including updates to things like the mail app and the calendars and the the basic stuff that you use every single day on the phone are rolling out not annually anymore, not with the main release. They're rolling out just as updates to the Play Store. Um, this is something we noticed a while ago. We talked about on the podcast when they started updating YouTube and, and things like that separately from the main OS. And like I think that this is increasingly going to – it, it there's, does two things. One is that you can get those updates on pretty much all versions of Android that are currently in use. So things like ginger, from gingerbread to, to jelly bean, there are Play Store updates for almost all of those apps come out day and date. As well as iOS soon. As, soon yeah, after. iOS as soon as it clears the App Store authentication process. Um, the other thing is that you have individual teams. It seems like the teams that are responsible for YouTube are doing the YouTube app, and the teams that are responsible for Gmail are doing the Gmail app, because when they do things like roll out new features in YouTube or Gmail, those apps are updated almost immediately on, on all versions of Android and on iOS shortly thereafter, which has been a big improvement. Uh, I think that this is going to prove to be, if Apple continues releasing updates for its core apps, the apps that ship with iOS, like Mail and Calendar and 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 all of that stuff, only with the annual updates, which is what they've been doing for the last seven versions of the OS, like that, it becomes a huge advantage for Google going forward. It 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 kind of does some some Sun Tzu turning our weakness into our strength business, which I I think is really interesting. Like yeah, it was that, a really good piece. Yeah, I mean that that's sort of. That's inherent to the to the two different methods, right? I mean, the, Apple's always been on the linear, the um, annual cycle. Yeah. Any kind of updates you want to get from Apple, you got to wait a year, especially for the ma- major ones, it's easily the hardware ones. And with Android, it had previously been you have to wait forever in some cases. Sometimes they, they just don't come to older hardware, and now they've taken taken yeah. added another platform above their platform. Yeah. Which is interesting. Yeah, but you hope from Apple then that they can actually make bigger leaps because they have longer to work on them. And well, they have to. And they know that it has to last a year. It also means, though, that they, they are probably less likely to take chances with stuff that may or may not be popular, because while it's Google true. can adjust more quickly, they're stuck for, say, 12 months or maybe three at minimum if something goes really badly for them. I hadn't thought about that. That's a good point. I mean, they, they do release it, uh, updates to their other apps, and, you know, the App Store app. Or, I'm sorry, not the App Store app. The, the Apple, Apple Store, Store app. Store app yeah. Or iBooks or any of the creative apps. They release updates to those. Doesn't like, iBooks come on the so phone often. now? It's uh, part of the OS now, uh, I that, think. That may be a bad example, but, you yeah. know, GarageBand and yeah. iPhoto, all that stuff. It's You know, you get point updates to that. It's weird. Um, this was SmartWatch week for no reason that I could tell, but everybody rolled out smart uh, samsung sony and qualcomm all demoed smartwatches my ifa that's why oh ifa what's ifa ifa what's the ifa i don't know exactly what it stands for but it's the ces of europe really there's a ces in europe interesting well it's not the same organization but it's the the equivalent it's consumer electronics it's at a time of year that makes sense for consumer electronics um did you? Does anybody care about? Did you buy a Pebble, Jeremy? You know, I have a friend who has a Pebble and uh-huh. he swears by it. So after the smartwatch frenzy the other day, I asked on Twitter, and and so um, Samsung's only works with Samsung, uh, Samsung Samsung phones, right? Samsung Android phones, is my understanding. If you have the Google Play edition of Samsung's S4, it's, it's not going to work. It's so you need TouchWiz or whatever. Um, I don't know about the Qualcomm one, and the Sony was basically just a teaser. Hey, we have a smartwatch coming that's going to be water resistant. Um, I asked on Twitter how many people who bought Pebbles are still using them because it's been long enough now that yeah, like, what they say overwhelmingly there were a a um of probably forty or fifty replies there were a handful maybe it was thirty replies there were a handful that were like 
I it's just in my drawer now because I got tired of charging it or it wasn't really that useful for me or whatever. Um, there were a lot of people that seem to use it the same way I use Google Glass. That's exactly my point next. Yeah. I wonder how many people, percentage-wise, who bought into Pebble or SmartWatch, how, how, what percentage of those people have r rarely use them now the same way that the people who bought Google Glass also rarely use them now? Because in this room, zero for zero. Well, come on. Zero now. for two. What's, what's As a matter of convenience, the one is a lot more inconspicuous than the other. It's not about it's, it's yeah. Not about, no, it's about inconspicuous for the glasses. I think I think it's, those watches call a lot of attention also, especially yeah, if you're like really? checking email. There were a lot of dudes wearing those watches at PAX, just a lot. I saw a lot of people wearing those Google glasses. There's there are types of people everywhere. There were two people wearing Google glasses. Certain types of people everywhere. Um, so the thing because it's fifteen hundred bucks. The thing that I found. But you're saying most people aren't using them anymore. Is that no, right? no, most people are. Most people are. Um, but because it's a watch, it's 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 less conspicuous. Right. So people were using the the watch. A lot of people said, "Hey, it's really useful when I'm busy." So um, one of the people who helps run PAX was like, "Yeah, it's been incredibly useful during PAX because I don't miss notifications and I don't miss where I need. It tells me exactly where I need to be when. Yeah. But it's much less useful on like a normal day to day basis because you know how many meetings do you have on a normal day? How many places do you need to be there out of the ordinary? Is that three hundred bucks? Like you can't look at your phone? Well, wait a minute. That, we're talking about the Pebble, and that was not three hundred bucks. Pebble was two okay. hundred hundred dollars sure. on sure. the Kickstarter, and it's e paper. You only charge it every yeah. three days. Yeah. It seems like it has some advantages. Yeah, I, and it's like you said, it's unobtrusive. The thing that the thing after instigating the conversation with people, a lot of people said, "Look, I wish it was like fuel band sized, so it was just like a right. little bracelet yeah, it's that had right. a screen on it." I think they're going to get bigger, not smaller. No. Well, that's what it seems. The trend seems to be like Samsung packed a camera in theirs. Yeah. I know, and a microphone, right? Yeah, it's microphone. bananas. Yeah, and a speaker. <laughs> what? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, Dick Hello? Crazy. Hello? Are you there? Banana phone, shoe I think phone. they're bigger. I think that they're going to release, I mean, uh, there'll be a diverge. You'll have like, like smartphones and dumb phones. You'll have the dumb watches, yeah. and there'll be the smart watches, the dumb electronic watches. I don't know, man. It's, it's just a matter of time. They might have to be bigger right now, but they're going to get a shrink. Well, so they'll, the, they'll, they'll be bigger because people want to do things like, oh, look at, look at the iPod Nano. Uh, you want to watch video, look at pictures, and if they don't put those things on there, then they're not competitive in their minds of the businesses. Like it's, it's the re exact reason why they had the, the the camera unnecessary. But if they don't put it on there, yeah. someone else is going to put it on there, and they're going to feel like they're left yeah, yeah. out. But that's the story of on, Android on specs. Yes, and then they're going to want bigger screens, and they're going to need bigger batteries, and eventually you're going to have a Pip Boy, or or Leela's <laughs> Leela's console. Yeah, it's going to be a full wrist thing, oh, and then you're going to have a, a like. 500 milliamp battery, milliamp hour battery on your wrist, ready to catch fire and tear your arm off. And then you'll have to get like anti-chafing, like like cream. leg warmers for your for your forearm so that it doesn't rub. You guys are awful pessimistic about this. I, I, I think mean, that smartwatches are not rad at all. I would rather they go the dumb dumb phone route and yeah. be long battery life and uh, but still have the functionality to like. If it just tells me that I have emails, that's I'm still gonna pull out my phone. It's not like oh. I didn't feel the, the vibration in my pocket that I had the email. It's just a, it's a, it's a very first world problem that you now don't have to pull out and You know, I, I have the plus first world problem where if my smartwatch doesn't let me delete like the spam I have, yep. and it just lets me know it's spam, and I'm not deleting it, it's on my phone, I need to pull up well, my phone. Well, it has a microphone, it. so you just say delete spam, delete spam, delete spam, Like Just knowing that spam. I don't need to respond to that email is not enough. It's if it's solving, a worthless email, inbox zero. It's solving a small problem, but I think it's one people are going to want to solve. I... I <laughs> It's again. It's it's like the Google Glass, right? If the price comes down to the point that it's that it's not expensive, then people will buy it to use for those times. The thing that's weird about this versus the glass is that glass is great because you also always have the camera there, and sometimes you want to take a picture. And the camera being at your eyes is a logical thing, it's, as opposed to it being. That, then the Samsung one has a camera, right? It's got 10, yeah, but ten second seven twenty p videos. It's ex it's almost exactly the same as the glass, except you're yeah. pew pewing right. like that Spider Man. <laughs> yeah, flip around. Yeah, uh, I don't know about the camera on the on the on the. Seems like seems like hey, new shimmers a floor wax, new shimmers a dessert topping. It's a little too close to that for me. Um, and also, I think the, the the watch looks does not look look aesthetically appealing. Yeah, I think that the, and that is the part. It's uh, somebody on Twitter said it reminds me of, and then sent me a picture of like the old Casio calculator watches from the early eighties. Yeah, had them all. And it's like they're cool now because they're retro. I mean, they were cool then, if you ask me. But you're did you did you case. do math on them? <laughs> yeah, because I wanted one and I never did any math. I never on got one. one. Yeah. I had one. It was the best thing ever. And then I never did any. I never use it at all. Game watches were cool. You know why? Because I could do the math in my head. Yeah. Well, you're Asian. Well, oh wow, that's, that's racist. I, I was. I let him. Yeah. Um, 
I yeah, I just think they have to look cool. And I don't like like and that means curved OLED screens because you wear it on your body. It's there. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's a, so it is a piece curved, of jewelry. Yep, curved exactly. watches are jewelry. That's why the the the, bra the bracelet model is much better than the watch model. Apple's going to have an advantage there when they make theirs. They got that aesthetic. I don't think Apple's going to make. Well, that would be the one more thing. If they're going to if they're going to roll out a smartwatch. It's not going to be one more thing. One that's more gonna, thing. No, that's going to be an invite. One that's more thing. That's what it's going to be all about. Um I miss one more thing. I miss one more thing too. One more, the best three they words had, in the English they language. They had one more thing last time. They, they've had one more thing in the past two since years. Since Jobs? They haven't said one more thing since Jobs died. They've had they've done things after that were surprises, yeah. kind of, but not really. And it was never anything huge. Retina, Retina MacBooks, yeah. the uh, the the uh, new Mac uh, Mac Pro, yeah, both was, of those. Those were one, one more, more things. things. But they were. I'm talking about. They were surprises. The end of the show. Yeah. One more thing. Oh, by the way, that happened twice. Yeah, it's fucking awesome each time. You're so angry. It happened one, and the first one that happened, which was great, was the um, was the uh, iPod with video. The one more thing was video. Right. Uh, that which, one was kind of bad, actually. And and that was after he said people don't want to watch videos on their on their, yeah. on their iPods. And what was the second? And one it turns more out thing? he was right. <laughs> uh, the second one more thing was. I don't remember. It wasn't the iPhone. I, I'm guessing there was more than two. Anyway. Name name two. I can't, man. I'm tired. <laughs> tired and ignorant. I've already explained Why that. are you tired, Jeremy? You've been taking Ambien again? No, I just have, you know, trouble sleeping. You I can't get in these coding binges, and I just oh. can't stop thinking. But you're, you're not a developer. I know. <laughs> As you just like to say. Um, the one more things. Oh, wow. There's a lot of them. 22-inch Apple cinema display, airport, iMac. Boy, these aren't as good as I remember them being. See? Uh, OS X. <laughs> Uh, Power a, Mac G4 Cube. It's like the bag you get when you leave a party. It's not supposed to be the main event. It's just a consolation thing. It's like, it's bonus. Aluminum PowerBook G4. And like those, you just throw them in the glove compartment of your yeah, car. The point is there's more than two. The iPod Mini, the iPod Shuffle, I would the say, iPod okay, with video, I, the MacBook I, I, Pro. iPod Mini, yes. Um, the uh, Unibody I, MacBook? Yes. The Unibody MacBook was a, was a separate event. Yeah, I was at that event. Yeah. Hold on now. I think what that... Okay, there was when they released the new Unibody MacBook Pro, the aluminum one. For one year, they released a standard MacBook in the same configuration with the backlit keys. Yeah, I think that might have been a one more thing. Oh, yeah, that, what, that's terrible! One more thing. Um, I FaceTime it. video <laughs> calling. <laughs> <laughs> of course you did. You're such a victim. Um, FaceTime was a one more thing. FaceTime. The was second one more gen thing. Apple TV was a one more thing in 2010. The Apple Music event, and um, See, not not memorable. FaceTime? Wow. That's FaceTime wasn't one more thing. iTunes match. It was, it was, everyone knew about it. Yeah. So it wasn't a surprise. Yeah. No surprises. Like, oh, there's 10 minutes left. Guess what? It's time for the one more one thing. One more thing. And the demo didn't work. His Star Trek demo. It's like, when I was a kid. I he, they asked everybody to turn off Wi-Fi. Yeah, turn off Wi-Fi for oh, the Oh, I remember work. that. Yeah. And Johnny Ive, he tried to do FaceTime with Johnny Ive. like, this is like the future. And then, nope, cut off. Oh, well. Um... So what the big news last week was the was out of Gamescom uh, the I guess it was out of Gamescom maybe it was a Nintendo Direct actually when I think about it was the 2DS Nintendo announced the 2DS and a Wii U price drop Wii U price drop makes sense it's it's two ninety nine instead of three fifty for the black bundle with the dock and all that stuff. However, the 2DS is bananas. The 2DS is a Nintendo 3DS without the 3D screen that nobody uses. Like I I. One of the things I did at PAX this weekend was walk around and look at people using 3DSs, and I saw one person with 3D on. When I asked him about it, he was like, oh, I, my finger must hit the switch, and I just didn't notice. So nobody uses 3DS on 3D on 3DSs. Um, but the 2DS is a $130 3DS. It's only 2D. Um, it plays DS games. And how much is a 3DS? $169 for the 3DS, the old one, and $200 for the, for the big one. Um so it's a, it's a pretty significant discount, but it doesn't have a hinge. Yeah. So it's flat it's out there. But it's not flush. What do you mean? Is it completely fl flat flush? There's no the front. Kind of angles. It's the angled. Up, right? No, no, no. There's a wedge. It's wedge shaped. Yeah. yeah so it's so not, the it's front not flush, is flat, but the back is. You can't lay it on a table and be flat. But you like, couldn't lay it on a slate with two screens. It, you'd, if you laid it on a table, it, it's it would not tilt like, up a little. It's not bit. like that. Um, it's more like that. No, kind of. that's not right. It's more. It's it's is. I could draw it for you, but I have a piece of paper. It's a, like a triangle. So this, if you're looking at it from the side, it looks like a triangle. So it's wedged. So it's a wedge shape, and the wedge oh, goes okay. up in the back. 
So the so the bottom the part toward your hand. Of course, you don't like it. You don't like anything. The part towards your hand is thin, and the other part is fat, as I understand it. Are the screens the same size as the screens small? are the same size as the small one? I believe. Yeah. So the only advantage here is they're not as they're definitely not as big as the big one. So you get you save thirty bucks off of the cheap one, and you, but you can't fold it up. It's basically indestructible and no three D. If you're not using three D anyway, you've already said most people aren't. Yeah, that's not a that's not a concession. I, the, the, so it's time to come out at the same time as the new Pokemon games, which the the general consensus among people who know games better than we do is that this is designed to be a cheap way to get your kid into Pokemon when he wants it with a thing that is basically indestructible because I assume that they looked at like returns and defects and warranty repairs and like that hinge is probably the Nintendo piece that does breaks. not understand social dynamics of, of playgrounds. You don't want to be the kid with the two DS. I don't think you give a shit, dude. I don't know, man. It's a new thing. Yeah, that one's newer. You think being newer is better than being better? Than probably. Well, mine is three D and costs I'm more. Talking about kids. But 3D's, my parents. My parents. Who likes three D? Can afford the big one. Also, you're not supposed to put kids under six in front of three D. That's that's the only thing that occurred to me is I don't let Peter use the three D. Yeah. So when he actually discovered it because his grandmother was playing it in three D, he was uh, he was amazed. He's yeah. Like, oh my god! It's, it's in the future. Three, three dimensions, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I was, and then, he, I, then his eyeballs exploded. So <laughs> then he was cross-eyed for the rest of the day. Right. But no, I could see this being uh, appealing to parents for that reason. Yeah, I, I feel like th- they are conceding that they shouldn't have done th- shouldn't have done a 3ds and they should have done a DS2. I think that's a I think that is a fair thing to concede. If if, if they did the DS2 as a big follow-up, that more people was bought it, and that's just confusing. They've evolved since then. Well, the three D, the well, DS was their best selling thing ever, and DS Lite even is still one of the best portables ever. No, I loved it. Right, absolutely. And getting all that buzz about three D was initially great, but didn't really translate to early sales. And they've kind of leveled out now. The, even though the you know the growth wasn't there initially, uh, but they had done a DS two and just focused on software. It's weird. It's weird. What, if we're talking about what they should do, they I should know. get involved in the app stores. So, do you want to talk about that story? That that big. Well, we're, we're talking no. about Apple. I was just going to say the one thing that the other thing about the 2DS that could have made it really awesome is if it had a bigger battery in it because it's a kind of bigger thing. Yeah. It and it seems like the battery life is going to be roughly well, which analogous was to the small 3DS, yep. even the, without the 3D screen, which is the battery killer. Right. Like flipping on 3D basically halves your battery. If they had done a 2DS, a, a Maybe DS2, not halves, as opposed to doing 3DS and then 2DS, yeah. which I, 2DS is a clever name. I'll give them that. Do you don't think it's confusing though? No. There's DS, DS Lite. There's 3DS. So this and plays 2DS. I guess it plays DS games. It plays everything that has a DS in the title. If they did a DS2, like a, like a follow-up, that's terrible. Then everyone abandons their DS, buys a new DS2 because it can play backward compatibility yeah. and, and, and high resolution and, and fancier graphics, but still have a great. I think Nintendo overestimated, and it's easy to say in retrospect, but they overestimated the enthusiasm for 3D. They can afford this. It's an experiment. They can't afford it. They cannot afford it. Nintendo? No, they can't. Oh, they, they can afford it. They can afford at this point. I don't think they can afford it. They can afford. Yes, they, they Nintendo can. still has a lot of money. Um, they have a Wii U that's kind of floundering, and then they have a 3DS, which is a pretty big success. But it's not. It's not a level. The same level of success as the three as the DS was. Like so, people are saying that kids are playing. Like even Japanese school yeah. kids are playing cell phone games now. Yeah. I want to talk about this. Uh, the John Gruber big write up about the problem with Nintendo. Maps. Nintendo in, in Russia. Oh no! And it was it, the boils down to where Nintendo is right now. Where it has been whether it, that the hardware software uh, top down stack that we're talking about control over both hardware and software um, works as a model. And I think the, you really can't compare consoles to. To uh, to game uh, they control the software that their hardware runs on. Yes, it, it's it doesn't make games. It it's it's not like I don't know, Will's doing something funky right now. Um, anyway, <laughs> I don't know what happened there. The prescription was, and a lot of people agreed, was that Apple should, like you said, from Dr. Gruber. Well, and also other people. He's not a like, doctor. Uh, he's not a real he's doctor. He's writing prescriptions. Renee, Renee <laughs> Richie from uh, iMore um, agrees. Go to iOS. Like, try, experiment. Release a couple games on iOS. The, yeah, yeah. But the point is... They did the Pokedex. Right. Compan- companion stuff. Feet in the water. Right. Yeah. I think that... Square's doing a lot of stuff on... If you put yourself in Nintendo shoes... nintendo And you're only going to make X number of Nintendo Nintendo games, like the Mario Galaxies and the people, ones that people really care about. Not new IPs, necessarily. Yeah. But the ones with your characters and stuff, and the ones that with... Using Miyamoto's time. 
That right. Mario Land for Wii U, by Miyamoto the way, I played can, that. It's fucking awesome. Miyamoto can only make so many games a year, and his 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 genius and his brand sells. And he's going to retire Nintendo games. No, that's his uh, Miyazaki. No, no, but I mean, he, 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 he will retire. Yes. There is a time <laughs> in the future yes, when no, he, he is going to not be <laughs> no, making no, games no. anymore. Miyamoto's we hope that he retires. I would Miyazaki like, is already retired. I would like for Miyamoto to live forever, but realistically. He is, he is not a young dude anymore. From Nintendo's perspective, if you're, you're going to devote resources for an experiment, if you, one option is to experiment in iOS, put your foot in the water even more, and actually go full on and make a yeah. a great Nintendo game, sell for 20 bucks, 15 bucks, whatever, and reach 100 million people, that is a slow bet. Or you could make a great Wii U game that you know everyone, high attach rate, Forty, fifty. All four million people who own those systems will buy, or a system seller, or or a system seller yeah. that will sell hardware that you're going to make some money on. Like it's still easier to make the decision for them to go first gen. Well, here's the first party. Don't you think that that's just uh, kind of an ego trip? I, I think it's a business trip. I think, I it's, think it's I, I think if you look at the if you look at the cost benefit analysis, there are only so many. The, the, if they do dive in iOS, I think they're going to half asset. I don't think they're going to put like. The They'll put Pikmin out. They'll either do an old game on iOS like that they don't have to. They just have to port over, like a Mar- which again people will buy a Mario Kart and iOS and old like I don't know man Mario N- Kart 64 Nintendo, and iOS. If they were talking about first party teams, uh, they know interface better than anybody. But I don't think the touch interface works for. They've their games. kind of fucked up touch. It would be though. a new game. It, it would be a new type of game. Yeah. I think that I, I don't know if they could do a great iOS game like they couldn't ju- yes they know interface but iOS developers have been working on touch only for six years now yeah. and but they still haven't got to a point where and there are some great touch games but not they're still casual games yep. there's not a hardcore Mario or Mario Kart on iOS and iOS only developers have been working on that problem for six years and they haven't solved it here's the other thing is I look at so there were definitely some great touch games for DS there have been a handful of great touch games for 3DS. But the strength of those platforms compared to the phones is that they have physical controls. And if and, you look at what... even my, the touch games are com- complement physical controls. Yeah, almost always, yeah. There's been very few occasions, stuff like K- the Kirby Rainbow Road game or whatever it was, where you had to draw the lines with Kirby that was fucking awesome on yeah. the DS. Most of the games are primarily physical controls. True. And while iOS 7 supports physical controls... And people will be able to like I would. T- you can't count on your users having. That's but not here, hundred million. That's not, that's a I'm gonna, small fraction. I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, if I could go to the app store and buy a thing that was a link to the past, and then they mailed me a Nintendo gamepad to hook on the bottom of my phone and connected with Bluetooth, I would do that in no question at all. And I played a link to the past probably fifteen times. I wouldn't five different platforms. I've made a lot of poor choices in my life. <laughs> it is a really good game though. Yeah. And and they have dozens and dozens of really good games. If they started rolling them out on on now that there's physical controls on that platform, it makes sense. I wouldn't because I'm also convinced that those that there's a huge market of iOS users who want the more than casual game, the four hour game, five hour game, on the. Uh, on iOS, on, on iPhone, because your iPhone is not a game system. You're, well, you, you're, okay. no, you're not going to be sitting on your couch playing playing your game and then sucking all that battery life and then having to charge. I don't, under, well, I don't, I don't care on my couch. Your, I don't understand your argument. The, the, with the addition of physical controls, how is, how is the iPhone now not both worlds? Five-hour games, casual games. Right. It, it, technically, it can be then, but the phone, because it is more than that, is also y- your communication device and your phone. Yep. Its value is more still more as that smartphone than it is as a game console, and because your the screen that, I mean, and the fair. battery power is limited, I'm I'm never going to sit on a bus and play a high graphic like like I could with you know a shield or, yeah. or I totally or, or, do or, I, but I, or DS, but you do casual games. You I do, to, I don't know some of those controllers could have batteries in them. and 2D games. That, that's like, that's a way to solve that problem. To, and 2D games aren't. Aren't like it's not like you're playing some fucking crazy 3D thing on uh, with if you're playing NES games or SNES games on your like SNES games would translate very well to those that size screen. Um, given but but the problem with them is lack of phys- the problem with all of the SNES emulators I've ever used on iOS is that the, the on screen controls suck and there's no good option for physical control. I think an easy way for Nintendo to make a lot of money and it's a safer bet if they wanted to go into iOS is to do the. the the, the Wii, Wii Store style system where they release back catalog 
on iOS. Well, that's what that's with what we touch just, controls with touch controls, like tilt controls, and then the option to you do. You could do Mario Kart or something, I guess. Yeah, but um, not, not a full on AAA. Now Android has had third party. Uh, I'm sorry, physical control support since forever. Yeah, is that not a phenomenon? Is that you not can, been successful? It's niche because it's all emulated stuff, so you have to get questionable, super duper illegal ROMs. Pirated ROMs, basically. It, the, the problem. What do you mean the the native the uh, the games that are written for Android don't support those there controllers? There aren't. There's not that great support for controller games in Android. Like old Xbox games, like Max Payne and stuff like that, work reasonably well. The support is there. It's the problem that is that they're not developing f- with that in mind. Yeah. It's 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 like uh, it's like controller support for PC was uh, a while ago. Yeah. Um. Yes, you can attach a gamepad, but. It's the throws me a little off, and it, it's it's not polished. It's the kind of thing that you like. Like clearly, somebody checked a box that was like, "Oh yeah, we should include hardware support," and then nobody ever plugged it in to test it. A lot of times. So yeah, it's it's I I don't think Nintendo is going to start releasing stuff on iOS anytime soon, guys. I don't want to break it to you. No, I'm just saying they should. They can make a hundred million bucks right there. Um, is that a number you reached through careful analysis? What? There's 100 million iOS users, and you think you get a sell, buck each from them? Two bucks, two okay. buck game. It's 100 million bucks. They could sell it for whatever they wanted. I yeah. think. I think that yeah. Nintendo looks at 99 cent games in the App Store as like everything on the top 20 being 99 cent no, games. But they could be the, the the thing that tips the scales. I mean, if they put out a Nintendo game, they could charge 20 bucks. Oh, it's, it's fi- uh, Square Enix does. I mean, all those yeah. Final Fantasy games, which have not aged well for the most part, are all fifteen or twenty dollars. And parents like, huh? Spend extra hundred twenty five dollars on a two DS, or spend twenty dollars and they get the Pokemon's right there on the, the phone they already have. I don't think they're ever going to release Pokemon's day and date on iOS and their platform. We'll see, man. You said that about Sega one day. I uh, no, I think we all thought the Dreamcast was going to bomb out. <laughs> I don't remember that. I, I mean, we didn't do a podcast back then. That was before podcasting. No, no, no I'm not saying I don't remember you. I remember people th- saying, you know, Dreamcast is going to li- be fantastic. It's the best console it was ever. Really nice hardware. Yeah. There's still no day and date for Sega. They do they do the back catalog stuff, you know, in HD remakes and stuff yeah, like that, that's true. which is wonderful on iOS. But there's no, it's not day and date. They still do t- you know AAA games on next gen systems and PC. Yeah. By yeah. the way, the Pikmin three, awesome looking game. That'd be an amazing iPad game. I'm just saying. I had never thought Nintendo could make a game that looks that amazing. Well, yeah. HD, they're, the kind of art that they've done that looks good in standard depth for so long looks fucking amazing when you blow it. Have you ever have you played GameCube games on Dolphin? Oh, yeah, yeah. Wind yeah. Waker on Dolphin looks fantastic. I haven't played that, just Mario. It's but great. Yeah. Um, should we talk about Sony's weird QX camera? Uh, sure. You went uh, and saw also this. Also at IFA. that the huh? lens? Yeah, the lens yeah. camera. Do you want to talk about it? Uh, I'd love to try it. It's kind of fear- funny. It's a cell phone attachment. So yes, uh, widely leaked last month. Um, see, leaked as a cell phone attachment. That's what you think it is because that's what the photos were, right? It, it, yes. it's hooked on the back of my phone. Right. So what you can do, what it is, is it looks like a lens, a little zoom lens, and um, there's a clip that you clip onto the back of that, and you clip on your cell phone. Okay. And you could take high quality pictures with your cell phone. That's one use case for it. Um, you can also take pictures. Hold on. Do you, do you use the phone as the viewfinder in that case? Yeah, it, so that has, N- has NFC built in. And because many Android phones have NFC built in, the moment you touch it to your phone, it activates kind of, uh, the Wi-Fi on your phone, launches mm-hmm. the app. And so you can. it takes about five, ten seconds. And then you can That's use a it long as a time. viewfinder. It is a long time. It's so it doesn't, but it doesn't communicate. It doesn't send the picture stuff over NFC. It just uses the just NFC to handshake. To handshake for okay. Wi-Fi. And that's why that's why you have to kind of that's why in that, in that model you touch it to the, the camera. What the advantage we just discussed is launching the app for me. NFC is launch, launches the app for you. Yeah, yeah. So, so you have Wi-Fi to use what? as a viewfinder. Yeah, I can launch the app though myself. So is this you like can, a, like Yeagering like, where you where you drift in and then you just bump fists and then yes. you like you're powered right. up? Now my problem with this, and I think it's cool. I'd love to see the results, but you still got to go through your camera's optics. It's not like the phone has a better camera all of a sudden. It's got the same lens. It goes through. Sensor. It goes through the optics of the new attachment that you're buying and your own. I mean, it's like it's just adding more layers of no, glass. No, 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 no. The kit, no, the the thing has a sensor on it. It's not like that's a cap that oh, sits see, on top is, of your existing this I camera. Didn't understand. Yeah, it's it's not. Yeah, it's not a cap that you put on top of your camera. It's lens, lens, so zoom system, am- and and sensor so it's, it's all in ca- that round package. It. It's a camera itself. Okay, so it's, your phone becomes the viewfinder, and your then, phone is only the viewfinder. Yeah, and gotcha. storage device. So where where does it get stored on the on the lens? It 
can st- there's an SD micro SD card slot, mm-hmm. so you can store your pictures on there, not raw, JPEG only. Yeah. Or it can send the full res over to your camera when you're just taking a picture. Funny. With okay. It. So, so the question I have is, does this let you do like Mission Impossible stuff, where you just stick the yeah. camera around the corner and in your viewfinder? Uh, so many. That bad, sounds awesome. So many bad upskirt jokes. Like, oh, that sounds bad. Yeah. Yeah, and, and in the commercials, it's like, oh, you can like now explore caves and like, you know, put your camera up on a brick wall or something and use the viewfinder to take a picture. Tape or, your camera to or, your shoe. Or put it somewhere oh, in a place where like put it through a fence and take a picture you know because it's a camera but then your phone is a viewfinder yeah, it's like a spy camera it's it is basically a very very high-end spy how camera. much does it cost 500 bucks for the high-end one 250 what? for the uh, the low-end one Dude. so they're basically pricing it like a point and shoot they're pricing it like a point and shoot because they basically are point and shoot technology does it collapse? inside it, it looks like a like a puck so it's it collapses it does to size. collapse to a puck size it doesn't have to be zoomed watch out. your language uh it's about maybe like four three to three inches tall okay. collapse Huh. So it's a roll. Um, my problem is that... Could you put it in your pocket? No, you can't put it in your pocket. It would be an unsightly bulge. It, it, my jeans, jeans pockets, no. Jacket pockets, yes. Um, shoulder bags, everything else, yes. It seems like like just just from, from I, at a very high level, this seems like a cool future idea. Hey, look, we took the parts of the camera that matter, put them into a non-traditional form factor, and then let you let you leverage the thing that you're going to carry with you everywhere anyway to do the stuff that you normally you would need the bigger thing for. I think they took the wrong parts of the camera that matter. Did they, so, what, are the optics any good? The optics are great. Okay, uh, it's the the Zeiss optics with, uh, so with the same the as the one sensor, that 100, the RX100. RX100. What is that? Um, like a quarter inch? That's, I mean, uh, what, the quarter. the high one one was one inch. And the uh, 251 is one two third inch, okay. Um, which is like a high end point and shoot. Um, they want a camera. Like ideally, we want technology to make things smaller. Like a lot of people think that big DSLRs are pointless now because you don't need that grip and that bulk. Well, it's nice. They're heavy, and what you really need is just storage, battery, sensor, and lens. That's why mirrorless cameras, those compact ones, they have the lens. You detach them, but they're small bodies and very great port- portable ever. So. Mm-hmm. Camera has the viewfinder, the lens or sensor, lens. That's really all you need, plus battery and storage. Right. Right now they're doing the lens and the sensor without the viewfinder, which means if you you can't change the lens, the lens and sensor are packaged together. All you can do is you can change the viewfinder if you buy a new phone. It's over Wi-Fi anyway. Is there a physical zoom button on the camera? No. You have to use the software. You have to. Uh, no, there is a physical zoom. Uh, on can, the camera, and, yes, and you can conceivably take pictures without having the camera there's attached. A button. If you there's a, there's if you think you can like aim without there's a sh- seeing, shutter button on the camera. Okay, so you can just press the top button. And does it autofocus? Uh, it does. You have half push down. Um, hmm. I would rather have you buy the sensor, which is the most valuable part of the camera, the thing you're going to upgrade every three years, right? A better low light sensor, bigger sensor, mm-hmm. with a good viewfinder. And then it's interchangeable. With and mirrorless then, And then lenses. you buy whatever lens you want. That would be Isn't awesome. Isn't that like the mirrorless cameras? Yes, but they make the mirrorless camera the size of a puck, a hockey yeah, puck. Right. Yeah. And then just have... And then... and then It's coming. I would be super into that. Because then, then you have something like... You're basically looking through a telescope. It's like the light Except it's digital. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then you're just holding the lens with a great... Uh, a, a, you know, whatever su- nice LCD in the back. That's not an optical viewfinder. But then you can swap that off and put a bigger lens on or, or macro lens on. And you upgrade that puck every couple of years with yeah. a better LCD or a better sensor, but you keep your expensive lenses. That's the future I want. This is not it. So we're on a, we're we're on a death march of podcasts right now, and we have a lot of stuff to go to. So I'm, we're going to mow through the rest of this pretty fast. Um, HDMI 2.0 announced also at IFA. Uh, HDMI does 4K right now, but only at 30 FPS. Yeah. The new HDMI 2.0 will do 4K at 60 FPS. The, the theoretical bandwidth is up now to 18 gigabits per second. Uh, Takeaway overhead is about 14 gigabits, but that also means uh, but it's using the same connectors and same cables. If you have a high-speed high HDMI cable right now, it'll work. So that means don't buy a 4K no kidding. TV. No kidding. Don't buy a 4K <laughs> TV. Celebration bells. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Does that mean your parking's up? Yeah. Um, uh, does that mean don't don't buy a 4K TV until it supports HDMI 2.0? Seems like oh, yes. Oh yeah, wow, that's yeah, yeah, bad yeah. for the TV yeah. manufacturer. Well, no, because they're nobody's like they're still seven thousand dollars, so nobody's they buying just, them. They yet. just came down pretty dramatically. Maybe and, like four thousand now. Or there maybe three. The Sony and the Samsungs just dropped it. The one that was twenty five grand last year, or no, 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 the no. follow up to that no, one. No, a month ago or the past few weeks, uh, Sony and Samsung dropped a, their prices a thousand and fifty and fifteen hundred. Oh wow! On the four Ks, so that's good. Okay, so um, 
Uh, Amazon introduced a couple of things this week. They accidentally leaked the Paperwhite and then made it official without even doing an event or anything. They just put it on the homepage of Amazon, which I guess I think is that the it, way to the roll out like, new Paperwhites. Yeah, they weren't going to do an event. Um, it, there's not a whole lot that's changed. They're saying the color contrast on the screen is better. It's a little bit faster. They're doing some software changes that add um, Goodreads. Uh, Goodreads integration, which they bought earlier this year, as well as like a kid's corner kind of thing, the same as they do on the on the video, the tablet Kindle Kindles. Yeah. Um, they also introduced Matchbook, which is like their auto rip uh, function for books. So if your book is supported, if your publisher allows it, any book you bought from Amazon from 1995 on you'll be able to, you to buy... pay full price for the book. Huh? You have to pay full price for the book. You couldn't... Well, no, it's not full price. You had to buy from Amazon, not from not from a third party. But it's only 20 bucks books or more. Is that it? We used in 1995. No, no, no. No, I mean the year 1995. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so 1995 AD on, if you have purchased a paper book from Amazon, it could conceivably be eligible and just show up as an option to buy on your Kindle at a massively reduced price. So like 99 cents to $2, depending on the title. But you had to have um, bought the book from Amazon. Amazon proper, not Amazon Marketplace and sellers. And selected publishers and titles. If it works like auto rip, I don't know if you pay attention to your Amazon cloud player, but I've had a shitload of CDs show up after that initial wave that I bought from Amazon, and then now they're just there. That's an easy way for them to sell more Kindles later with higher capacity. I predicted auto rip in the Max PC podcast days, by the way. I remember. It was a good idea. I just didn't think they'd ever get the studios to the the publishers to allow it. Um, I think this is great as somebody who sold, who well, donated all of my books to, um, and it gets you to buy the book. San again. Francisco Public Library. I will happily pay two dollars to get any of those that I want to read again in the future back versus six dollars. Um, I think it's awesome. Uh, this is the dumbest story of the week. Am, am, Android four point four is not going to be called Key Lime Pie, guys. It's going to be called Kit Kat. Is this the first Android to have a trademark? Yes, and uh, zero dollars were exchanged. Well, fuck, massive co-branding money like that. That yeah. Why would you not do that? The problem is KitKat is owned by Nestle. So if we're talking about companies that are evil and do things that are bad, Nestle is real high on that list because they they I'm four bars at all time. <laughs> oh boy, you've been saving that one, haven't no, you? No, it was in the, the they did an ad, they did a, a mockumentary uh, or mock you commercial. Yeah, spoofing Apple it was on the site. Um, and it, that was. That was one of the jokes. You can use it. You can four ball yeah, yeah. Finger, f- the width of a finger, you know, and yeah, yeah, perfectly designed KitKat bar. Give me a break. Um, yeah, Nestle's evil. Uh, there's a new Yahoo logo. I think get more bars is such better than give me a break. As as a like, yeah, make use uh, of the bars. They've it's been the pop culture. They've been branding give me a break for what for twenty f- they, there's, since there's, I was a kid. There's a jingle. Yeah. Do you know that Nestle owns KitKat in the rest of the world and Hershey's makes it here? I no. didn't know that. No, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, they're the U.S. distributor for KitKat bars. Did, did, were you guys excited about that um, Google leak of the new phone? That, in the video? Yeah, yes. In the video, and then they took the video down. The Nexus 5? The Nexus, yeah. Was that exciting to you? It's interesting. It's, it looks like it's LG, if if people who analyzed video frames were, were correct. Um, I'm, I mean, new Nexuses are always interesting. Do you think that was a, I th- on purpose? I think with... No. The, no, they wouldn't have pulled the video if it was on purpose. I think that the Play Store... The Play Google Play editions of the of the flagship phones from HTC and Samsung is renders the importance of Nexus a, a lot decreases the importance of Nexus. Hmm. Um, but still, it's good. That my, I love my Nexus Seven. It's great. I use it every day. I've almost stopped using the iPad Mini except for iOS games. I'm giving mine to G- Joey. Your Nexus Seven? Would you not gonna have a tablet? Or are you gonna go back to the iPad for photos? I think Joey deserves it. I, I think that is great. Um, Work paid for it. Yeah. Um, there's a new Yahoo logo. Uh, they did a thing that I thought was really clever and did 30 days of, of alternate reality logos uh, leading up to the unveiling of the new logo. And it really reminded me a lot of the story that I don't even know if it's true or not, but of, of the eBay, the e- first big eBay redesign when they decided that they didn't want the site to be yellow anymore and they changed it to white overnight and people flipped out. So then they changed it back to yellow and lightened it one shade a day for 256 days until it was white and nobody noticed. Nobody complained. <laughs> so funny. I think doing new new logos every day for 30 days kind of paved the way, and it's a, it's a good way to do that. It's a neat trick. Uh, do you guys like the new logo? Have you looked at it yet? It's like purple, it. and it has kind of the simil- similar O font. It's oh, not yeah. flat. Yeah. 
I don't know. I don't see the reason why that you should change it. Um, I like the old font just fine. The old logo. Yahoo! Um, new YouTube logo, too. Jeremy, you pointed this out. It's real flat. It's super duper flat. Yeah, I thought it was inspired by the new iOS 7 design, but they're rolling oh. it out everywhere. That's New Android looks pretty pretty much like that. It flat. looks like an Android. Yeah. yeah. Um, Amazon sells more volume online than the next 12 online stores, the next 12 biggest online stores. It's funny you bring that up because I just went, I was searching for good prices on some hardware and I went to an old favorite of mine, geek.com. Ooh. You remember that? Digging deep, yeah. It's a great little mom and pop shop and they, if you go to their website now, it's gone. What's they have it? closed their doors and they, they're just completely what is it? right. It's called geek.com. Geek.com? Yeah, it's actually a California-based company. Huh. And they are blaming Amazon. They say they can't compete with them. But what, what's they can, there They now? can afford to lose money. We can't. Man, we should buy geek.com. I don't think we can get geek.com. <laughs> Probably <laughs> worth more than, uh, yeah. Uh, a lot of the stuff, that stuff's gone away. Remember Price Watch? Sure. Yeah, we were talking about Price Watch the other day. I mean, that was a, that was a real revelation for me. Um, Amazon's basically Sears Roebuck at this point. If you're buying stuff online, if you're selling stuff online and you're not Amazon, you're probably not really making much of a dent in online sales. Uh, the Lenovo Yoga 2 was announced at IT, IFA? IFA. IFA? Uh, this morning. Uh, this is the Haswell Is Yoga it the 2? same as the other one, but Haswell? 13-inch only to Ooh. start. Uh, thinner, uh, a little beveled, slimmer, uh, backlit keyboards, uh, and the option for a quad HD screen, I, it's more than quad HD, but it's uh, whatever, 3200 by uh, 1800 resolution. 3200 by 1800. Higher resolution than my 30-inch monitor. That's crazy. On a 13-inch screen. What What is it going to be? That well, I guess option. Windows 8.1 handles that I better. Think it's stupid. Why? You don't need 32. Even reg- Regardless of how Windows 8 handles it, you don't need 3200 by 1800 resolution screen on laptops. Give me better desktop panels. Give me better luminosity. It's only 350 nits too. So it's nits. Co- nits. How many Brightness. nits is your? How much? How many nits is my she MacBook Air? That's about uh, that's about 350 to 400. But the but MacBooks are so much brighter. For some reason. Okay. Consistency. That's a backlight. You are unhappy with the high resolution tablet. I'm unhappy with the decision to go with high resolution tablets well, as opposed to brighter tablets. It's going to impact battery life. Well, you too, can. Right? You, there's an option not. Yeah, yeah, of course. But yeah. there, uh, there's an option not to get the high resolution one. But to play that game, I think it's a waste of R and D resources. Um, we talked about the Apple TV. Uh, NASA 3D printed rocket motor parts that previously were like 31 individually machined parts. So they built the model, they changed the design a little bit, but they used a SLS 3D printer, which basically you know, fuses metal in thin layers, just like our, uh, very similar to the shape waste printers you've seen, where the model kind of, kind of rises up out of the foam, yeah. the, the foam pellets. You suppose it's less expensive than machining them? Um, it seemed like it was less expensive for sure. Uh, they could iterate faster, so instead of, you know, if you look at the number of man hours in making 31 individual components for a single motor in a in a multi-motor rocket engine, then this means that they can try new designs much faster, I think, is, yeah, the, is the understanding. If it's cheaper, great. Um, and it also means that they can make designs that would be impossible to machine, yeah. like or would be very difficult to machine. Robots don't need lunch breaks. <laughs> Thanks, robots. <laughs> that was a subtle hint that I need a lunch break. Um, well, that'll do it for w- news this week. Uh, the good news for you, Norm, is we're only two or three segments away from being done with the podcast. Uh, let's take a break and talk about what we've been testing. I want more music than a tone. I clicked and I clicked and I clicked again. Uh, we did a video about the Leap Motion. It's not very good. You should watch the video if you're hesitant, if you're curious about buying one. It's also awesome. crap. It's the most frustrating video to watch, and that's not a diss. That is, no. I was feeling your pain. So here's the thing. Studio lighting do not make stuff that works on infrared work particularly well. However, the in a sitting in the studio where we sat to do where we sit to do all of our videos, this video and all the rest, it's not the lights that cause it to not work because even when the room's dark, it didn't work right because there's these big metal ducts up overhead and they reflect just enough that it got really confused. Um, even in my bedroom or my, my office at work, which is a converted bedroom, there's nothing metallic on the ceiling, no overhead lights. It still isn't very good. What we showed was maybe 5% worse than it normally is. It is not a product you should spend money on. That's it. It did make me want to try the Google Earth thing. The Google Earth part is pretty cool. You can... 
I think I'd be good at it. <laughs> I can make that. I can give you this experience. Um, I when I was in Seattle for PAX, I ran over to Scott Heimendinger's house, who you may know as the Seattle food geek. He years and years ago did a DIY sous vide machine that was like for seventy five dollars worth of parts, you could do an immersion circulator that will would let you sous vide meat. Um, do you know what sous vide is, Jeremy? You're looking puzzled right now. No. So uh, the, the idea between, behind sous vide, it's a, it's a process that was invented, I think, the 60s, is that basically when you cook meat, your goal is to put on something that's hotter than you want the meat to be and then take it off when it reaches the appropriate temperature so that it's cooked. Because the, the cooking process basically has to do with proteins denaturing and stuff like that. And that happens at specific temperatures. For the most part... And heat goes out in. Right. So you put so say you want to cook a steak on a griddle, you put the griddle the steak on a thousand degree griddle where the metal's white hot. And then your goal is to pull that off as soon as the internal temperature of the meat reaches 125 or 130 degrees Fahrenheit, which is where your perfect medium rare steak comes in. The idea behind sous vide is that the the linger time doesn't matter that much. So why not put a, a your piece of meat in a sealed plastic bag? sink it in a bucket of water that's exactly the temperature you want the meat to end up and then just leave it there long enough for the meat to reach that, reach that temperature. Now there's more complexity to it because if you have something that's like that's a, a kind of naturally tough piece of meat like a pot roast or short ribs that has a lot of collagen and connective tissue, you want to let that sit long enough that that collagen and connective tissue break down into gelatin. But basically the idea is you reach the meat when, you're, when your New York strip reaches 130 degrees, it's done and then you can take it out and finish the outside so you get a Maillard reaction and get the nice brown, tasty bits that end up on the outside of a piece of steak. So with sous vide, what you do is you put it in a bag, you heat the meat to the exact temperature you want by keeping the water at precisely the temperature you want, and then then you do that. You can do it with eggs. You can do all sorts of stuff sous vide. And it cooks it consistently through? There's no red center? So you end up with, if you cook the... If you cook you do it for a lot longer than you would. Yeah. Not necessarily, but an hour versus... You're saying the linger yeah. doesn't matter. The linger, the linger matters in that the longer it sits, the more of the connective tissue will break down. So if you put a really nice steak in and let it sit for 12 hours, it's going to be like a jet mushy mess because all the collagen is going to break down. It'll be terrible. But... Yeah, so you take you can take once you take the steak out of the bag, you finish it either on a hot cast iron skillet or take it on your grill and put it on real high heat just to brown the Give outside. The edge, yeah, yeah. Or you can even take like a blowtorch and just you know run it run it down the side. Yeah, real man. Um, but but the idea is that you have a very thin layer of of the Maillard reaction, and then the rest is just perfectly medium rare, evenly all the way through. Got it. That was a long description. Yeah, sorry. That's all right. Um, why why are you telling me about this? So I went and saw the Sanzare, which is Scott's new Kickstarter for an immersion circulator. It's a two hundred dollar machine, wow. um, which is very inexpensive in that realm for something that prom- that should that seems like it's quite good at first reaction. I actually saw a couple of them in of the pre production models in in action, um, and, it, and it looks great. It looks really good. Cool. So you buy this little thing that looks like a thermos. It looks uh, like a pepper grinder. Size of a size of a pepper grinder or a thermos, and you strap that onto a bin, water, or a, just a or pot, tub or a pot, yeah. and put your vacuum sealed bag of meat, or just just straight up eggs in there, or a Ziploc even, because the temperatures don't yeah. Ziplocs are fine for the temperatures you use, and you have some really good f- restaurant. Fish or yeah, if you've eaten, let's see, if you've eaten at if you've ever eaten at a restaurant, you've had a a piece of red meat that was like you know, a 16th of an inch brown edge when you cut into it. And then the rest is just pink all the way through. It was most likely sous vide. Oh. Um, so yeah, the, the existing circular immersion circulators are either not very good, have some kind of problem. Like they can't do enough water to do a large ba- a batch of ribs or something like that. Or they were crazy expensive. There's a poly science circulator. And I think their entry level model is like $450 or something like that, which is, which is more expensive than, you know, most people are going to use for what's a, fairly yeah. this is limited half use thing. This yeah. is 200 bucks, and it seems really good. Um, the controls are really simple. There's a spinny knob on the top that you twist to uh, to uh, adjust the temperature, and it's a tenth of a degree precision Celsius, which is important if you want to do things like soft eggs, 65 degree Celsius eggs and stuff like that. Heating element, thermometer, 
and a motor uh, and, a, and a circulator, a blender. Yeah, you'll let us know when the Kickstarter goes live. The it's Kickstarter is finishing tomorrow morning. Tomorrow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Should so on that, has it? It's it's, it's gotten. It is seven hundred plus percent funded. Hot damn! People were really excited about it, and he has, he and his team of people seem to have their shit together. They sent it off for cert already, so like they're getting an underwriters lab certification and the whole thing. Um, and I think it works on 220 volt as well. If you're a Euro or Japanese person, that was one of the, the uh, stretch goals. Stretch goals. Um, Norm, you've been using the shield for roughly 48 hours. Uh, a little more than that. And uh, first impressions. It's not very good Android tablet. Okay. <laughs> have you tried streaming PC games yet? Because that's what I'm interested card. in. We'll oh. be using that today. Okay, we'll try that. We'll we'll let you know about that next week or maybe the week after. Um, I got an automatic. <laughs> driving thing? It's a driving thing, yeah. So um, pretty much every car made after 1996 has a standardized data port on it. It's the thing that has like little prongs on either side of a plastic stump, and you just it's like a if diagnostic. You, it's port. a diagnostic port. Yeah. So this thing plugs into that, and you cook it up your phone with an app, and it does things like tells you what your mileage is. Sometimes you need these to reset the check engine light yourself. Exactly. You can use you can use it for that. Um, but this is more to give you like metrics on your driving. So this is the app and it tells me that on my way into work today, I drove 16.6 miles. I spent $3 and one cent worth of gas Wait, based your on car knew this. Well, the app, yeah, yeah. because my car knows how fast it's going. Well, the phone knows how fast it's going and where, where you're going, what the distance traveled is because it tracks the route with location services. Uh-huh. Um, it tells me that I didn't do any hard braking, which is good for fuel economy tells me that I didn't do any hard acceleration, which is also good for fuel economy. tells me that I drove uh, less than a minute over 70 miles an hour because I was passing someone once. Um, I spent $11 in fuel this week. I've gotten 19.3 miles per gallon average in my escape, and I spent two hours in the car. That is a lot of information. It's, it's kind of cool. How much is it? 70 bucks, I think. All right. Also, it kind of sticks out in the bottom. Like it tank, depends it's like on a tank of gas for me on a bad day. Yeah. Well, it also, if the check engine light comes on, it tells you what the actual problem is instead of just saying, hey, you need to go to the dealership exactly. so you can make yeah. the they, judgment they have yourself. Those techno- if you just want that, there are many cheaper options. That's like, tw- yeah, those are 20 bucks at AutoZone, basically. Right. But with, this their, has, with their own screens. Yeah. But this is just app, an app based one. Um, it has all the data. And so do you leave it in your car? You leave it in the car. All the time. Yeah. The neat thing about it is that when you do the behaviors, it, it, it's, it's kind of like driving. You know when you were learning to drive and you were driving with your dad and he'd yell at you and you brake too hard? It kind of does that because when you hit the brakes too hard, it, it, it makes a little chiming noise. It's like, hey, dummy, you just hit the brakes too hard. Yeah, I know. I hit the brakes too hard. When you accelerate too hard, <laughs> I don't need the it makes a me. chime noise. <laughs> it also beeps when you go above 70 miles an hour because no. that's when your fuel that's efficiency so dies. That's so annoying. You can configure You can that. turn all of that stuff off. Oh, my God. It's like having a, a, someone in the passenger seat. You just broke too hard. Yeah. It's I a, know. I was annoyed by that within about 10 minutes. I'm leaving it on just to see if I change my behaviors. <laughs> my uh, hunch is that I probably won't. I kind of want one now. It's, it's, if you like Fitbits, it's like a Fitbit for your right. car. Yeah. Um, anything you've been testing, Jeremy, you want to talk about? No, man. Let's, let's, uh, let's, uh, I think we're going to skip. No new gear? Uh, like I said, I've just been, you know, in this coding land. Uh, uh, right. That's it. Just coming up for air. Anything you, well, you'll talk about that when you're done. Yeah. Um, it seems like the next door neighbors are doing some hard songs, so we're going to take one question and wrap it up. Emails? Well, but we do the other one. Emails. It's, you know, we don't do emails, we do emails. No, 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 no. Questions. Boom. If you have a question for This Is Only a Test, the email address is podcast at tested.com. Keep it short, under 45 seconds, and make it sound like you're not in a place where people are sawing concrete next door. Uh, sorry about that, guys. Uh, here is our first question. It comes from Scott. He says, Hey, Tested, I have a quick question for Norm. What advice do you have for taking good pictures at cons? I have a Canon SLR, an older Rebel EOS XSI 450D, and was curious if you have some general camera settings, types of lenses, or shooting techniques you recommend for shooting in this environment. Uh, I'm from a small town in Ohio called Findlay. There's a rumor that the inspiration for Dave Thomas's Wendy's restaurants came from a burger spot we have called Wilson's. Also, Mark Metcalf, who is the maestro on Seinfeld, is from here. Thanks, and always be testing. Thanks for asking. Uh, it's a good thing that I have a column that I write on the site every week that addresses this topic. You should go read it. Well, it's not just con photography. It's, you talk about other stuff, too. Well, there you go. And con photography is a big part of that. I've never seen you so bitter. You're just bitter. I, I'm hungry. You're hungry. I'm hungry. My gosh. Do you have any, had, any high points? I had three and a half hours of sleep, and I'm hungry. Fast lenses? Uh, it's all spend more money on gear, I guess. Okay. 
<laughs> that's that's <laughs> nice gear and go a long way. But you don't need it. When I asked you if you wanted to answer this question, <laughs> that wasn't the answer that I was, was expecting. That was two and a half hours ago after one false start. Uh, that false start is going to get used. People, um, people like those nice depth of field shots. You want a nice low f-stop to give you that. You want to be able to you know, control your focus, get it on what you want, and blur out the background. Try that. You like that. An expensive fast lens. Yeah, yeah it's expensive. That's expensive. Yeah. Um, I'm, uh, we're in a very fortunate position where we have access to some good gear uh, that we can borrow, and that, that helps a lot. Well, so the other, But the other thing, though, is if you want to try other stuff, you can use services like borrow lenses and stuff like that to relatively inexpensively rent expensive lenses for the one or two weekends a year that you'll use them, um, which we've used to great benefit before we had access to a lot of good gear. Uh, and I guess that'll do it for us this week. Uh, we have a bunch of great stuff on the site. Uh, Wes, Wes is, if you watch the YouTube channel, you saw Norm and Wes talking about a feature that I think is really awesome. And it shows our new feature layout. Uh, but it's about the weirdest thing I never knew existed. Um, there was a arena show that celebrated all of the George Lucas film properties in you mean the, the Disney film properties. No, George, at back, the time, it, this is old. So it was the Lucasfilm stuff, including Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Willow. It was American Graffiti in there? Howard the Duck. No. THX 1138. The Tucker's last one. Tucker, A Man in His Dream. The Man in His Dream. Um, and it, it was a Japanese arena show, like a thing that went to, I assume, like civic auditoriums or throughout Japan. The interesting thing that a lot of stuff didn't make in the story um, when we did the interviews, uh, but... Uh, the arenas they went to was interesting uh, because these were facilities that weren't like sports arenas. They were uh, test-taking arenas. Oh, so like where you go to your prefecture so to take your... Where like thousands of people would go to take tests and then the seats would like, you know... That's very Battle re Royale. Re re rearrange and, it would, and then they can do performances there. Massive, so they don't have facilities. They, like they don't do the monster truck rally in the Kyoto pre Prefecture no. Civic Auditorium? Spelling bees and math quizzes. Um, there are a couple of, like, you should read the story. It's great. And you, we'd love to know what you think about the new um, uh, new feature design. Uh, but if you like it, share it with your friends and, and encourage them to come over and check it out. Because that, that lets us do more things like that. And watch your John Landis interview because I want to see more of those. That's uh, cool. So, yeah, Adam sat down in the talking room with Landis. That was a good segue. Um, John Landis directed Animal House, Blues Brothers, um, Spies Like Us, um, American Werewolf in London, uh, Thriller, the Michael Jackson music video, Trading Places, Trading Places um, Beverly Hills Cop 3, and uh, a significant portion of the Kentucky Fried movie. Um, and he and Adam sat down for about an hour and talked about uh, like what, what, how movies have changed in the last 30 years. Uh, they talked a lot about like Rick Baker and special effects in American Werewolf. They talked about John Belushi directing John Belushi in Animal House. They there were a couple of good dick jokes. Like it's all around a good conversation. Um, and definitely, if you if you're into that sort of thing, you should watch that and check it out. Uh, and then the last thing is that Norm's Dragon Con Gallery, which was as always amazing, but shows off a level of costume that I kind of didn't expect to see. Um, is is worth your time, and then we'll have more stuff from Dragon Con. Uh, there's a video with the, about the Sansara on the site right now. You can check that out if you're interested in sous vide, um, and, uh, and you know just general stuff and things. So that'll do it for us this week. Uh, if you want to hear the Pax conversation, you know while we were doing the podcast, I actually read the the post by Gabe about the apology post, and it seems like part of it was them getting quoted out of context. Uh, well, according to him, of course. Uh, part of it is you should just read the post, but, but I'm going to leave the other stuff there at the end because we said we would. So uh, it won't be on the YouTube version, but it will be on the audio version. So if you want to listen to that, then you can skip forward to like uh, two hours and 37 minutes or something into the audio version and it'll be there. Uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for coming. Jeremy, anything to plug? No. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks for coming by, man. Fun. We'll see you guys uh, next time on another edition of This Is Only a Test. Bye-bye. Oh, today's outro is brought to you by 333. Coming down the hill, it's really steep right here.
driving.